he did something. He's involved. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no way he's not involved. I think that he may be equally as equally as involved as somebody else. But he's right. definitely not innocent. He did something. Maybe he did kill her. Welcome to the Kevin Clancy Show. I've been in this game over a decade, and I knew I needed a place where I could run wild on my own solo podcast, where I tell personal stories, I deep dive into conspiracy theories, we rip through the current events of the day, and we do sit-down conversations with the most interesting people on the internet. Make sure you click subscribe so you don't miss an episode. What's up, you mutts? It's another episode of the Kevin Clancy Show. It's the Spite Tour Phase 3, Episode 5. Today we got Payne Lindsay on the show, the creator and host of the true crime podcast, Up and Vanished, just wrapped up Season 3, where he is now calling for uh, the authorities to take action uh, to try to solve the crime that he has been investigating. I mean, this what this dude does is absolutely wild. Like, this one is uh, uh, a, a cold case of a missing girl. It was an indigenous person, and he's, like, out on the reservation talking to suspects who may or may not have kidnapped or murdered or done whatever with this girl and other girls, dudes who are pulling guns on him, guys who are, like, you know, keeping him at arm's length. And he's just, like, a regular dude who decided to be a podcaster that kind of turned into, like, investigative journalism, a little bit of, like, vigilante justice and he's out here just making a boatload of money trying to solve crimes. It's fucking wild. If you're into true crime, you know Up and Vanished. It's one of the, the biggest true crime podcasts, if not the biggest. And at this point, it's turned into an entire uh, media company for him. So Payne Lindsay on the show. I know uh, any of my girl listeners who are obsessed with true crime, you're going to like that one. Uh, so we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, as always, though, we begin with my bones to pick. So the Kevin Clancy Show bones to pick today are brought to you by 3 Chi. My first bone to pick is with the real Christmas tree community. It's that time of year again, folks. It's time to put up your tree. At least it's time to put up your tree if you're down with the fake trees. Because I can put that shit up for months if I want. The day after Thanksgiving, I can start. And I don't have to worry about my Christmas tree dying early. I don't have to worry about watering it and keeping it alive for the next month plus. I can just put it up for as long as I want. I know a guy who leaves his Christmas tree up until St. Patrick's Day. No lie, his family's fucking tradition is to leave it up until March 17th. And the only way he can do that is with the beauty of a fake tree. And I know this is a big to-do every year. We argue about real versus fake and colored versus lights, uh, colored versus white lights, all of the different arguments. And I know, I know the, I know the stigma attached. I'm not a buffoon. I'm not a fool. I know what people think about me when I say that I am a fake tree guy and I'm a colored lights guy. You call me white trash. I know you do. And I'll even accept it. Fine. I like my above ground pools. I like my fake trees. There's a little bit of white trash in me. Go fuck yourself. I got no problem with that. Why? Because my Christmas tree looks fucking perfect every single goddamn year. There's no variance. There's no change. Sometimes it's too fat. Sometimes it's too short. Sometimes it falls apart. There's holes in it. There's none of that. The, Chris the fake Christmas tree is the perfect triangle when you close your eyes and you picture a, 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 a picturesque perfect Christmas tree. It's the shape of a fake tree and you unfold it every year, it looks exactly the same, it's full, it's delightful, and let me tell you something else. Here, here's what people talk about with the, with the real tree. Y you don't get the scent. I don't fucking like the scent, okay? I don't know what to tell you there. We're never gonna see eye to eye. I don't particularly find pine needles to be that enjoyable. And people say, oh, well, it smells like Christmas. Well, there's plenty of other fucking things that smell like Christmas. I'm gonna light a candle that smells like Christmas cookies. You know what's better? than sappy filled pine needles, delicious Christmas sugar cookies. How about that? You know what smells better than pine? Fucking hot cocoa, okay? There's plenty of things that remind me of Christmas that don't smell like pine salt. Who wants fucking pine salt? It smells like you just cleaned the place. What's next? You want your, your Christmas tree to smell like bleach? Get out of here. So don't even talk to me about the smell. How about the, the people who say like the experience? Because it's one thing if you go buy a, a, a fake, uh, a real tree, whether you go to a Christmas tree farm or you do it on the corner here in New York City. If you're a fucking psychopath that goes out there and chops down a tree, what the fuck is wrong with you? 
What are you, some sort of lumberjack? What are we living in the in the fucking, you know, before the industrial revolution when we go out there and hack down our own trees? In what world is that a plus? In what world is that a check for in favor of the real tree? Oh yeah, no, you know why I like real trees? Because I gotta go do some manual labor as a logger to get one in my house. No, it's fucking patently ridiculous. And even if you do just pick one up off the street, my favorite tradition of all time is here in Manhattan watching two drunk girls try to carry a tree home. They go out for the night, they hit up a wine bar, they have a couple teenies, they get a charcuterie board, they drink, they complain about their boyfriends, and then on the way home, they see the guy on the corner, and they're like, let's just get a tree. And they get one that's way too big, they, boom, they throw it through that thing that puts a giant net on it, and then you gotta watch two girls in high heels carry a tree home to set up shop in their apartment. It's amazing. The only good thing about real trees is watching dumb girls try to take them home with them. Cause that's, when really when you break it down, that's the most ridiculous part. You're out here just cutting down plants, cutting down the foliage of the world to bring indoors. It's dirty, it's got bugs in it. You got bark breaking off all over the place, pine needles falling to the ground. You gotta fucking water it and keep it alive. Give me a break. In what world is any of this good? And they say, well, it's about the experience. I have the same fucking experience you do. The fun part is putting on the ornaments. I mean, it's really not even that fun, to be honest. Putting on the lights sucks. It's really, it's putting on the ornaments. And you put the fucking, I also do the star on top. Again, white trash, I know it, and I fucking love it. Who needs an angel? What, are you trying to tell me that Christmas is still a religious holiday? You're out here still thinking about Jesus and the angels? Fuck off. Put a star on top. Put a Santa hat on top. It's all about Santa and presents and commercialism. Fuck the religious aspect. So give me that fake tree with the colored lights and the star and I'll embrace my white trashness and I will still enjoy the tradition and the fun part of decorating the tree. It's easier to hang my ornaments. It's easier to fill it out and have it be all even. It's easier to put the lights on. And I'll tell you what, I'll even go a step further. Every single year, I bought, a, I bought a, a, a new fake tree like three years ago. And at the time, I was like, dude, just go all the way and spend the extra money and get the tree that has the lights already wrapped inside of it. So you just gotta pop, pop that bitch up, plug it in, hallelujah, Christmas vacation, bam, the lights are on. And I was cheap and I was stupid and I was like, no, 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 I'll just get a regular tree and I'll put the lights on. And then two years in a row, when I get the lights back out of the fucking box, I plug them in to test them, not a single fucking light works. And if I had just spent the fucking extra money two years ago, I would just have the lights every goddamn year. And instead, each and every time, I'm out here buying a new set of lights. So I go so far as to say, not only is the fake tree better, but the fake tree with the pre-programmed, pre-planted lights is the supreme, the superior tree. Because that, that's not the fun part. All this manual labor shit you guys talk about as if it's a good thing? No. I don't want to have to wrap the lights and make sure they're all even. I want someone in a fucking factory to do that for me. I want to go ahead and hang my own ornaments. Oh, look at this. This is the ornament I made for mom in second grade. That fucking sucks. But hey, nostalgia. Or hey, these are the ornaments that uh, when I used to break them as a little kid, my mom would freak the fuck out. Did you guys have those ornaments? We have these icicles. These crystal icicles. One, one was like just a long spirally, and then the other one was kind of like a teardrop. And my mom was always like, "Don't you don't touch those? I'll hang those because they're crystal, and you're gonna break them." And I thought they were so cool, and I would hang them, and I would break them every year, and I would try to immediately hide them. And my mom would be like, "Why are there only four left when you know I bought twelve of them?" I don't know, mom. That's the fun part: hanging the ornaments, listening to the music. It has nothing to do with making sure that you have a breathing, living tree, and don't even talk to me about the environment. You're just sitting out here chopping down trees, just ripping trees out of their natural habitat to put into the inside of your home. I hope you get mites and bug, bed bugs and fucking lice, you weirdos. In what other world do you drag bushes and shit from the outside inside? And then it's all fat in the middle. It's never really triangular. That's different. Plants. First of all, look around. I don't have any plants. 
So I'm pretty anti-plant in, in that department as well. If you want to tell me that you, you'll, you're going to have like a, a nice potted tree that like gets delivered to your house or something, maybe I can start to meet you halfway. But you're talking about a tree that just has an exposed stump that is gonna die. That's the difference. Plants stay alive because it's in the pot with the soil and you do a little bit of watering. You gotta set up that weird thing where it's got those like, those fucking, I don't even know, those little things that you screw into it so it stands upright and you put the water in the bottom and you never water it enough. Oh, and let me tell you something. Here's a little fact for you. Between 12 and 15 children die per year because of fake trees and fires. That's definitely not true. But there is a chance your tree could catch on fire. Guess what? There's no fucking chance my tree catches on fire. That shit is safe as can be. And maybe it doesn't start a fire, but your tree is much more prone to fall down. We got a girl here, Devin. One year her Christmas tree fell on top of her. Bam fucking flattened her. So now every year, they still put up a real tree, crazy assholes, and they tie it up. They tie their tree, the fucking trunk, to the wall to make sure that it never falls on one of their kids again. I have a goddamn idea, you wackos. Get a fake tree! If every year you're gonna cut down a tree, drag it into your house, set it up, and then make sure you have to put in fail safes so that it doesn't fall on any of the children, how about you just change the fucking tree? You goddamn wackos in your preposterous traditions. My tree looks better. It doesn't smell at all. It doesn't, I don't have to worry about it staying alive. It's not gonna shed needles everywhere. I don't have to vacuum. I don't have to worry about bugs. I don't have to worry about my safety. It, there is not even a, an argument. And I still have the fucking real tree community out here telling me that I'm trash. Okay, with your dirty plants that you drag into your living room. I'm, I'm trash, you got bugs crawling around your fucking house. I'm trash, you gotta worry about your apartment burning down. I'm trash, you're trash, fuck you. And white lights, pfft. I'll tell you straight up, right to your face, if you have white lights on your tree, you're a racist. Just plain and simple, white lights, you racist. You might as well put a fucking hood on top of your tree because you're in the clan. Give me some color, Sp spice up your life a little bit. You think if you go to the North Pole, everything's just like white light? No. Give me some reds and some greens. Fucking, we'll even do it for the Jewish people. Give me some whites and some blues. Give me some color. It's Christmas. Not everything's black and white. Certainly not everything's all white. Racist. And if you put the angel on top, you're a religious zealot. How about that? So let's just get it straight. You're ruining the environment, and you're a racist religious zealot. And I'm, I'll be over here at the white trash party with amazing trees that look great, that don't smell, that aren't a problem, and aren't contributing to the, the racism and, and religious zealots of America. But fine, go ahead. You guys have your real trees and look down on us. We're, we're the guys over here just laughing at you, you fucking weirdos. My second bone to pick is with uh, all of America, basically. I don't know how this wasn't a bigger story. I guess I gotta blame myself for missing it, but I feel like this deserved more trending time on Twitter, more exposure, more headlines. Um, so I'm blaming you for this one, America. It's brought to you by Cuts Clothing. If you're looking for something to get for uh, the guys in your life for this holiday season, it's Cuts Clothing. People say it's hard to buy clothes for guys. No, it's fucking not. It's easy. You get them a t-shirt or a v-neck or a hoodie or a split hem. All plain colors. Get them a black. Get them a white. Get them a tan. Get them a blue. Give them a navy. All of the, the plain colors that match with every single pair of pants, every single jacket, every single style. It doesn't, you don't, you'll never go out of style when you're wearing Cuts clothing. Not only are they comfortable and made from high quality materials, but they will always be in vogue. You'll always be on trend if you're wearing a classic white or black tee, or you got a navy tee to match with your jeans, or you're rocking a, a, a leather jacket over your tan or gray shirt. It's Cuts clothing for the holiday season for all the men in your life. You can get the crew neck, you can get the V-neck, you can get the elongated cut, you can get the scoop cut or the split hem. They've got the hoodies, they've got the t-shirts, the long sleeve tees. They've got plain, nothing on the front. They've got the ones with the cool uh, Cuts clothing design 
with those, the two needles in an X. They got the one that just has the block C or that just says cuts. Everything very minimalistic, very cool, very sleek, very comfortable, and you'll look sharp. Right now, go to cutsclothing.com slash Kevin and you'll get 15% off your first order. That's Cuts Clothing, C-U-T-S Clothing.com slash Kevin. Get 15% off site-wide today. I also want to shout out everybody who bought something for uh, Black Friday. I'm wearing uh, one of the hoodies now, the, uh, the hood print for the Moon Man. We had one of our biggest years uh, with Sad Boy Season and the Moon Man line and everything KFC Radio related, helping pay the bills, even people buying our cups and our glassware. We got our uh, Moon Man canvas prints, so it's not just clothes anymore. We've got, you know, cut, uh, we got kitchenware and, and stuff to design your house with. We really are becoming like a full brand of, of all sorts of products. And really, uh, I know Dave kind of really leaned into it for his sale this year, but the best way to support us and shows like this and not have to lean on advertisers or worry about uh, haters and canceling and all that is to buy our merch directly because nobody can stop that. Uh, we'll always put money in our pocket to help fund operations like this and keep us going. So thank you to anybody who bought. I know that it's a lot when we start uh, promoting on Black Friday and Cyber Monday and we're really jamming it down your throat, but we really end up making like half of our money in one weekend to try to keep this operation going. So uh, appreciate anybody who put up with us and supported us and also a enormous thank you to everybody on the merge team nobody ever thanks them dave's always clowning on the mike welkers but you know welker has been there since the beginning and he takes the the brunt of it and then we never end up talking about the rest of the people we've got allison and alex and pilar and all these people who are going through the sample process with us and the shipping and the distribution and the promotion and they make you know a a, a clothing company for like 30 different franchises run they're unbelievable so thank you to them my bone to pick is with america and how we didn't make more fun of this Joe Biden fart over, over in the United Kingdom. Earlier this November, Joe Biden goes to the fucking environmental summit and he ripped ass in front of the Duchess Camilla. And it was like a big to-do over in England and we didn't even say shit about it over here. Now, I'm sure some of you might have seen this because it is a couple weeks old. So I apologize if you were on the Joe Biden ripping ass at the fucking environmental summit. But the fact that that wasn't, wasn't a topic on the rundown, I didn't see it for one minute, man. It wasn't talked about enough on social media and over here that it just kind of went under the rug. Joe Biden, the president of America, goes overseas, drops some heat, farts so loud that it, it made news over in the United Kingdom. This Duchess Camilla, the, the, the exact quote was, she can't stop talking about it. That's almost such a powerful fart, you come back around. Like anytime you fart, it's embarrassing. But if it's such a powerful fart that your guest, or I guess in this case your host, is so offended and appalled and astounded by it that she can't stop talking about your fart, well, that, that, my friends, is just, that's marking your territory. That's establishing dominance. Not since 1776 has someone from America owned England like that. Joe Biden's just over there fucking crop dusting, ripping farts that were so loud and stinky that everybody there was like, can you believe what just happened? Joe Biden probably just shit himself at the G8 summit. We didn't even say anything over here. I'm, my, my bone to pick is with all of yous. Nobody, nobody gave me the heads up. That 78-year-old Grandpa Joe was farting in his Depends over at the fucking environmental meeting. He, was, he fell asleep, I saw that. He was dozing off when they were talking about the environment. And people love to jump on him for that. Like you wouldn't be falling asleep if you were in some gigantic auditorium with people droning on about the environment. We get it. You know, you keep chopping down Christmas trees, we're all going to die soon. Who fucking cares? I'd be asleep too. And, and, and the reason why you know this is true is because he already shit his pants at the Vatican. Remember that one? Poopy Pants Joe met the Pope. He had a 75-minute meeting with the Pope because he shit his pants. Nobody meets with anybody for 75 minutes. You get in and out, but he had to change his suit because he shit his pants in front of the Pope. So if you, if you, already, if you shit yourself at the Vatican... You'll shit yourself anywhere on the planet. You, you know, he'll gamble at this environmental summit, no problem. 
You think, you know, his aides were probably like, Joe, you know, you had a lot of dairy. Be careful. Do you, you sure you don't want to go to the bathroom before the meeting starts? And he's like, listen, pal, I shit myself in the Vatican, okay? I'll fart in front of whoever the fuck I want. You think I'm impressed with Camilla? You think I won't fart directly on her? Please. Pope Francis saw me fucking, saw a log rolling out of my pants. You think I won't fart on Camilla? Give me a break. I'm the president of the United States. I fart where I wish. I, you know, we either, either got to make fun of Joe or talk about him like a hero for farting overseas, but this can't go undetected. We can't not talk about it. What a moment that we just let slip by. Can you imagine, can you believe that like Camilla, who's like some duchess, which is like the fakest shit in the world, you know, they're like the Kardashians over there. They don't actually do anything. They're figureheads. They're going to environment meetings being like, we got to save the fucking planet. It's like, shut up. We know you don't mean, you don't do anything. Talking about all these global emissions and Joe Biden's dropping an emission right on your face. And she's talking about it like to everybody. Like everyone, like how was the thing? And she's like, oh my God, it was crazy. Joe Biden was farting, farting up a storm. If you're talking to, to other people about someone else's farts, like you really left an impression. That is truly, it's, uh, you know, at some point you gotta tip your cap. Be like, Joe Biden farts all over the world. Like that's America, man. We drop bombs, atomic and farts, and you can't stop us. I, I saw they broke down the Vatican. It was like Obama met with the, with the Pope for 52 minutes. Trump met with the, with the uh, Pope for 34 minutes. Joe Biden, 75 minutes. Yeah, because you talked for half an hour, and then you spent 45 minutes in the bathroom trying to get the shit stain out of your underwear while your, one of your aides ran you a new suit. Everybody shits themselves every, you know, every now and then. Everybody at some point is going to have an embarrassing moment where you gamble on a fart and you shit your pants, especially when you're 78. The only problem is most of us do that, you know, maybe, worst case scenario, at work. Most of the time, you're probably at home. Most of us aren't in the Vatican. Most of us aren't at environmental summits. You got to pick and choose your spots to shit yourself. Or, like I said, you just, be, you know, power move, I shit myself wherever I want because I don't even give a fuck. 75 minutes with the Pope. Oh, and a third bone to pick since we're talking about how long meetings go. I got a bone to pick with all the college football fans who are, uh, who are up in arms about Brian Kelly having this 11 minute meeting with his team at Notre Dame. So if you don't know the story, Brian Kelly, football coach at Notre Dame, out of nowhere decides to leave the program and go coach at LSU. Kind of a crazy move. Notre Dame is like right on the precipice like, they had a shot at being in the, in the uh, top four this year. Not going to happen, but, like, next year could be. Recruiting class, your coach is there. Everything is set for you to potentially win a national championship with Notre Dame. And you bail early to go to LSU, which is a great football program in its own right. But Notre Dame, while I believe it's one of the most overrated sports uh, entities in, in the world today, it's still, it, the name has the cachet for a reason. And it's like, yeah, they haven't won a fucking title since like sports was integrated. But if you're the guy who gets the job done and brings that title back to South Bend, you are a sports immortal. You go win a title with LSU, congratulations, that's awesome. You're, you're now a national champion. Plenty of people have won at, at LSU. Nobody, nobody cares. You're not like some, you're not in the pantheon of coaches, you bring a title in the modern times back to Notre Dame, you're, you're getting statues, bro. Your family is like, you know, you're talking, you, 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 you become like a political figure, okay? <laughs> you become an immortal. So, but whatever, he wanted the bag. LSU comes along, here's $95 million. I'll be honest, I thought it was at least gonna be 100 after Lincoln Riley got 110. Notre Dame decides to not match it, even though they've got a $12 billion endowment. You're not going to break off some crumbs to keep your head coach. All of that surely can be debated. The, the hot topic here seems to be, though, the news got out before, the, before he could tell his players. He sent them a text message saying, I didn't want you guys to find out that way. The news leaked. Tomorrow we'll have a meeting, 7 a.m. I personally, I'm not waking up at 7 a.m. Everyone's like, oh, these guys are up anyway, working out. Fine, whatever. I'm not going to a meeting at 7 a.m. for a guy that I know is no longer a part of my future. You can fuck off, Brian Kelly. But they're all saying, K 
can you believe this meeting was only 11 minutes? Now, I get what you mean. You've been recruited by this guy. He's been there for a long time, years of work, and, and then all of a sudden he just bounces and you get an 11-minute 11 11 minute combo. I, I get what you're saying optically, but really think about it. Set your fucking clock right now for 11 minutes and think about if you were just sitting in a locker room with some dude fumbling through his words, trying to come up with some reason that it's okay he's leaving. Think about any meeting you've been at at work where you know some manager is just lying right to your fucking face, blowing smoke right up your ass. You do that for 60 seconds, you're like, get me out of this room, let alone an 11 minute straight speech. That speech needs to be one minute long. It needs to be, hey guys, I know we were doing something special here, but I got an offer from this other program that me and my family just cannot refuse. This is financially and, and whatever else, exactly what me and my family have always wanted. I'm doing what's best for me. You guys do what's best for you. Sorry to anybody that I'm you know, uh, uh, leaving, but hey, we all gotta make what, you know, we all gotta make our best decisions for, for ourselves. Done, boom, that's it. What can you say to a guy who's just honest about that? In this world, as, uh, in his job, he is, he's a hired coach. Sure, he cares about kids, but there's always gonna be new kids, there's always gonna be new crops of kids, new recruiting classes, he's getting money, he's getting the bag, he wants to be there, that's his fucking prerogative. If, I, if, if, I'm, the, if I'm a player, I got a problem with Notre Dame. Not matching that, not, you're fucking Notre Dame. Just beat that offer. Keep Brian Kelly and go try to win a national championship. Notre Dame is the villains in this story, not Brian Kelly. And not the 11 minute fucking speech. If anything, that, that speech is too long. Who wants to get broken up with for more than fucking five minutes? You need, it's not you, it's me for 11 minutes? You need to tell, you need to hear, I didn't do anything wrong for 11 minutes? Get the fuck out of here. That's 10 minutes too long. That's insincere. People think that he's gonna have like this hour long emotional breakdown with these people. No, it's a job. He's a fucking psychopath like every other head coach. He wants the glory and the money and this is the best place that he feels he can get it. So he took it. End of speech. People acting like you need to read the Gettysburg Address to these kids for, you know, fucking a three hour lecture. No, 11 minutes is plenty. If anything, it's probably too long. So to the real tree people, to the, to the entire country of America that didn't let me know that Joe Biden let an impressive fart rip right in Duchess Camilla's face, and to the people who got a problem with Brian Kelly leaving and giving an 11-minute speech, those are my bones to pick. Let's get into our interview right now with Payne Lindsay. He is the latest on the Spike Tour. I'm out here continuing to book my own guests, and uh, I'm still landing guys like Payne, top podcaster in the game today, top of the uh, true crime genre, which, as we know, has been one of the biggest forces in all of podcasting and all, in ent uh, in all of entertainment. Uh, and today, it's brought to you by Manscaped. Payne was a, a sleek looking cat, man. Came in with the bleached hair, swag, dripping, very cool cat. I'm sure he's the type of guy who manscapes. A modern man manscapes. That's just plain and simple. If you're living in the modern world, you gotta manscape. You gotta make sure that your balls and your dick and your chest and your pits and your back and everything is smooth and clean. Because otherwise, why would anybody wanna have sex with you? Why would anybody want to get down with a hairy dude who doesn't take care of himself? It's not even the hair necessarily, because some people like a hairy chest or some people like a natural look, but the manscaping shows that you care and that you're trying. It's like, hey, listen, I got underneath there with a fucking a device they call a lawnmower with a light, and I really went to work for you. So let's have ourselves a time, huh? Let's get all up in it. Because if I'm willing to manscape, you know the old, like, I shaved my balls for this? It's like, yeah, I shaved my balls for this. I did it all. I got the lawnmower out, and I trimmed it. And then I got the ball, the crop preserver out, and I rubbed it on my balls. And then I got the, the ball deodorant, and I put it on there so I don't smell. And then I put on the moisture-wicking manscape boxers so that I don't get all sweaty. And I did it start to finish so that I would look good and feel smooth and be good. So let's have ourselves a time. That's what a manscaped man, that's the message they put out there. So you can go to manscaped.com, use promo code Clancy, you get 20% off 
plus free shipping on all of, they got the nose trimmer, the hair trimmer, the ball trimmer, the lotions, the serums, the creams, the boxers, the uh, toiletry kit. They've got everything you need to make sure that you stay hygienic, clean, and smooth. It's manscaped.com, promo code Clancy, get 20% off, plus free shipping. It's Payne Lindsay on the Kevin Clancy Show, Spite Tour, let's talk to him. All right, <clears throat> let's get into it. The Spite Tour continues, we got Payne Lindsay on. Uh, from Up and Vanished, which is, I would say, uh, like the premier true crime podcast, really, right? Is it? I think so. I think so because it's had, in my mind, more sustained success. And I know, well, I shouldn't speak out of turn because I know there's a ton in, in this space. I know there's a, it's a big industry. But to me, you know, like Serial came on the scene and that was a phenomenon, like I think for the podcast industry in general. But then I, I thought the subsequent seasons were kind of like, meh. Yeah. And Up and Vanished, I think, is still just like cooking with the same fire and still has that same hype around it. So in my mind, if not the, you know, one of the most premier in a, I mean, to call it like a popular industry is, is an understatement. Crowded. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in a good way, in a bad way, because I think there yeah. are so many rabid fans and it's become like an obsession, but also, you know, everyone and their mother is trying to do true crime, so... Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you're at the, the, the front of that. I appreciate it, man. It, yeah. Is it, do you feel like the pressure of it? Is it like, oh, fuck, for sure. Everybody's got one or, or do you feel like I'm the, like the godfather of this shit? You're all behind me. <laughs> I think I go, I probably go back and forth to be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Up Advanced came out right after Serial and there really wasn't that many podcasts like Serial right. back then. Right. But since then there's a, a, a shitload of amazing true crime podcasts. Right. So, so see, that's interesting you say that though, because to me. That, and bad ones too, but <laughs> no. But that just says to me that I think you are comfortable enough in your status of where you are to be like. There's plenty of other amazing ones, you know. It's like <laughs> right. But up and vanish is still the, is still the goods, man. It's I honestly don't listen line. to true crime podcasts. Do you listen to podcasts in general? Uh, not really. That's I, funny. I, I used to, but I stopped. make too many of them now. So I did the opposite. I always made them. We started like almost ten years ago now. So before it was really like the boom hit and everybody had a podcast. Um, is when we started. And so when the the boom, like when everything took off, I was already in the mindset of like, I make these, I don't listen to these mm -hmm. and never really listened. Uh, and then I we started interviewing a lot of comedians and I started watching a lot of their specials and I always loved those. And I was like, wait, I can get more of these guys. So I recently have started listening to them. But for the longest time when I told people I don't listen to podcasts, they were like, what the fuck? But are you and, listening out of like research a little no, bit? No, or are you, are you, you just know, actually just leisurely? Accidentally, I, I have stumbled into things. I, I listen for fun. I just listen because I like these guys. Uh, but along the way, I've been like, you know, when they do this thing, that bothers me. And I kind of do that in my own show, so maybe I should change that. Or okay, yeah. when they do this, I like that. I need to do more of these things. Or So I've learned a little bit. But no, I just started listening uh, like on the commute as, as entertainment. But it's funny. you know. I guess it is a little bit you know, paradoxical to be a one of the most successful podcasters, but not take interest in it in your own personal life it's weird i think it, like my podcasts to me are so consuming mm -hmm. that i just don't even have the headspace to dedicate like i used to with like a serial or something where right. i'm just i'm thinking like an investigator i'm you know wanting to know what happened i can't really do that when, anymore when you don't have a, a regular job of like i mean the podcasts are made so perfectly for a commute or sitting at your desk 100 or when you're doing like mindless work when you're doing work that consumes your mind and you have your own like projects that you're working on, I, I totally get that. That yeah. it's like I don't have the it's not like I don't have the time to do it, but it's like I don't have the dedicated time to just zone out and go into this world and like But you did listen to serial. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, honestly, listening to serial season one was pretty much one of the main reasons I made a podcast. That was like the inspiration. Because I was like, right? oh, podcasts are cool. Right. Podcasts can be like this. Yes. And yes. I should make my own version of something like this because I was bought in at that point. Yeah. You know? That was incredible, wasn't it? It was like... Oh, it was amazing, yeah. It, it, and I don't know what it was. I didn't know what to expect from it. Same. And and just like the, the piano keys dropped yeah. and like the, the, you know, the clips and the audio and I was just like, <laughs> oh, this is just like an audio documentary. Like this exactly. is unbelievable. But the way... It's funny that like how enrapturing, if that's a word, it was, where it was just like, oh my God, I need another, I need this, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, who did it, I'm going on Reddit, I'm arguing with people, we're screaming and yelling, you know, and then I think what, what happened was interesting, was after, you know, the serial boom hit, 
and then it was like the jinx and making a mur how to make a murderer all that shit and then I started to pick up on how a lot of these aren't very impartial and a lot of them do have their own oh, yeah. you know and I was like wait a minute this isn't a documentary this is this is Fiction, not fiction, but yeah. this is entertainment. And I can see, you know, this guy's on this side and this producer's trying to say he's innocent, whatever. Um, so you start to get kind of savvy to, like, the way, the inner workings of the true crime world. So we're, I mean, I would, I would think, I feel like you're pretty, like, down the middle still. I feel like you don't... I try to be. Yeah. I mean, I still, like, you're, you're I'm still putting also, together though, about, a story for you that yeah. I have my own feelings and thoughts and I want you to think similarly to me. So I'm not... I don't not do that. Right. It, yeah. I mean, you're, you know? you're upfront about it. Like, I think in yeah, but I try season, to be, uh, episode three or four of this season, you were kind of like, now, you know, not going to lie, I'm walking into this guy's house, like, with, right. with some preconceived thoughts here, you know? Sure, yeah. Which is only natural. And then, like, because exactly. the listeners feel in that same way. Yep. It's, it's, uh, it's the, so far this season has been, has been great. And it's like, I think what's very cool about this season is uh, how unique it is because it's like, it's a world that, 99.999% of us don't know. Like, oh, yeah. That the Native American culture, life, reservation life, all of that. I do think there's been enough talk about... <laughs> there's been a lot of talk about how there's not enough talk about the missing the people that go missing. Yeah. And it's, but it's very cursory. It's very surface. Just like, oh, hey, that's happening without actually taking any action. Oh, I, exactly. Yeah, and that's I've been why, a part of many of those interviews recently, and I'm like, where were you guys four weeks ago when it yes. wasn't so buzzy to talk about? Mm -hmm. like, and so, yeah, uh, that was my question. It, it, does it feel like Johnny come lately's now to be like, I'm, I, I'm going to speak up about it. And it's like, well, you know, good for you, but it's been going on for fucking probably decades. Now. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I feel two ways about it. It's like, okay, yeah, I should do this interview because... It's more exposure to the case, the problem, but like it definitely gets under my skin. Absolutely, fuck off. Where you guys know? a month ago? Yes. Like, yeah. You all of a sudden care? It's like, but ultimately, like ultimately, it's it's good for the exactly. The cause, so I'm like, right? okay, quit thinking like that. Yeah, Just yeah. Think about the bigger issue here. <laughs> so what was the? So let's go through. Uh, for the people who don't know, there's three seasons of Up and Vanished. First season, you. Like what? What made you? What made you pick each each case as your focus? Uh, well, season one was Tara Grinstead who went missing in South Georgia. My family grew up in South Georgia, okay. and it's all the towns are pretty close to each other, and it was like one of the biggest unsolved cases in Georgia. And just, so, in, so like you just had no. So just from by the news googling just, immediately, right. I'm like, okay, this is a pretty big case, mm -hmm. and turns out that you know my grandma knew a lot of the players involved and it was just so close to my family that it just kind of felt like the right case to explore plus I could just drive down there and right you know just come back and forth to Atlanta and so I just picked that case and just started looking into it and asking people questions and like, so where are you at in your life uh, when you decide to do that like oh, how man. old are you now how old are you then I was 29 okay I think so yeah 29 what or are you 28 I think yeah uh, and I was just basically dead broke freelance filmmaker. Really? Uh, I was directing music videos, and I did a lot of really cool ones with like big budgets and stuff, but I was my own producer, and like I was the last person to get paid, and I got screwed so many times, and it was just always chasing a check, and that mentality yeah. was just driving me crazy. Yeah, and I was, was creatively unfulfilled. One. Right. And I had just listened to Serial, I had just watched Making a Murderer, Watch the Jinx, mm -hmm. and I was like, man, like these are just so gripping to me. I I want to make one of these. I feel like if I dedicated the same time, I could piece together a story like this. Mm. I mean, that was a silly thought I, at the time. The time but, was silly. <laughs> yeah, but um, well. I just did it, and like I made Up and Vanish the podcast, thinking that I was going to make some documentary. After that, like that was just going to be a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know you could make money in podcasts, or <laughs> that anyone would even care about podcasts <laughs> beyond serial. What, and what year was that? That's like, <laughs> that was 2016. 16. Yeah, uh, the amount you know of I mean? times <laughs> I got asked, like, "Oh, you, you make money doing that?" Or like, "Oh, that's your..." Or, "But what do you do for a job?" I'm like, ah, "That's what I, That is what I do for a fucking, fucking job. job." Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's great. I love a good like that. To me, now podcasts, it's so saturated. It's become a punchline. Everybody and their mom has a, a podcast. Yeah. But you go back far enough in time or you find the right shows and, and examples where it's like this was this is a life-changing, like no barrier of entry, 
meritocracy for the most part. Like if you're good and you and you make it and it's quality, it will go viral. It does, you know. Yep. And you can go from nothing to something, you know, just by a couple cameras or a couple mics and, yeah. and an iTunes account. It was like, and that's that's to me what I still I put all my eggs in the podcasting basket a long time ago and so I just love to hear the stories of like I, I mean, did the same and thing and I was yeah. I, mean, I just kind of like once it sort of taken off I just sort of I just rode the bull man I, I made another podcast after that and another yeah. one and another one yeah and I just like basically lost my mind making podcasts yeah. but <laughs> looking back on it I'm like oh I kind of built like I guess the name for myself in this space during that time but I was just head down working and that's what tinderfoot is is that like mm-hmm. tinderfoot uh was tinderfoot Tinderfoot TV, TV, but we just call it Tinderfoot, really. Right, so it's just yeah. like, and that you own that, that's yours? Yeah, so me and my business partner own it. Fuck, man. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I do, how many How many shows do you do total? Do we have like 12 shows now. Wow. And They're mostly you, true crime. Are you like in all of them, like producing all of them, probably, overseeing them? I'm, pr- I'm like, I'm producing all of them, but I'm not always as hands-on as something like Up and Vanished. Right. Um, I'm hosting, I think, like four of them. Up and Vanished is like one of our big flagship shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, Radio Rental, which I'm kind of in, but Rain Wilson plays this sort of like spooky store clerk host, and they're like real scary stories. Cool. I like um, that. And then Atlanta Monster, uh, Dead and Gone was one of the new ones we yeah. did, and I hosted that. Uh, so yeah, a lot of death, a lot of weird shit, and you're like, a lot of weird shit going on over here, 100%. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, uh, it's, it's crazy to me how obsessed people get with the true crime world. It, it is crazy. And then yeah. I think specifically it does seem to skew more female. Mm-hmm. Not to say that it's only a female thing. Jackie was yelling at me about that. I don't think it's only chicks, but I do think girls do seem to gravitate more towards it for, I, I, I don't know why. So it feels like a little bit of a morbid like thing to be attracted to when yeah. a lot of the cases are female murders and disappearance and stuff. But in general, the morbid obsession with cold cases and, and whatnot is... A bizarre one. It is. I don't know what it is. What I, I think that, like, do you have any insight on that? Like, like the do you just make them because like fuck it, it's working and, and you're good at it, or do you have any like color on like the psychology of why it works? I mean, I feel like I mean, I'm totally could be labeled the true crime guy at this point, but honestly, I, I'm not any more obsessed with it than you would be, or any sort of general listener who was like, yeah, I liked serial or yeah. I enjoyed the Jinx. That's like where my fandom comes from. I don't really like geek out on these case details and evidence. I just like telling a story and trying to figure out what happened mm-hmm. and putting together something that just feels powerful that hopefully actually makes a difference. Right. And so like that's where I come from. Back to the like the why females might be more mm-hmm. interested in, in true crime. I think that my, in my opinion, a lot of times because there's so many female victims that are being talked about, maybe there's a level of, uh, like, how do I prevent this happening to me? Yeah, this could be me. Or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, at least that's what people have told me. Right. And I, I kind of get that. I yeah. mean, it goes both ways, but I, I can see that being sort of like, oh, you know, this husband killed his wife. And I was like, oh, well, my husband. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Uh, it's, unfortunately, it's unfortunate that you do, they do have to kind of, you know, think about those things. Yeah. And worry about some stuff that a lot of times guys are just not even raised to For sure. think twice about. Um, but it is, you know, I've always thought that people who can like write a horror movie or produce Saw or Hostel or those, mm-hmm. I'm like, something's fucking wrong with you, man. You're 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 a little crazy For too. Sure, yeah. If you can like immerse yourself and come up with these storylines and these these scenes. Now this is different because you're not like you're not coming up with it. It's it's you know fact is stranger than fiction in this case. Yep. But. Uh, do you find yourself being like fucked does it up in the head? You at all? Yeah, you're just like so surrounded by these horrible, yeah, I mean, details. I definitely have had to like learn to compartmentalize certain things and just tune things out yeah. to be able to not let it emotionally affect me or just make me go completely crazy. Right. Um, I mean, people get lost in these things. Usually, it's more. Yeah, like it's the very easy to get lost in it, especially when you're making it. And at the end of the day, I'm also making a show, yeah. so it's like. I could feel all these different ways, but if it doesn't translate into something that you're listening to, to where you understand that, yeah. or it just sucks, or it's boring, right. I'm doing the whole case a disservice, and it's pointless. So like, I, I have two things going on. I care a lot about this case, and actually figuring out what happened, but also making a show that you want to listen to. What do you think is your priority? I think, I think that's shifted over time. Mm-hmm. I think that I've learned that, um, 
I've made so many podcasts at this point that a lot of the storytelling parts of it are kind of like second nature at this point for mm -hmm. certain aspects of it. And so if I just focus on finding out what happened and just keep pushing that as hard as I can, mm -hmm. then all these other things are gonna fall into place. And so it's, it's almost like a split down the middle. It's like there really isn't, like I care a lot about it being amazing. Yeah. But also, like five years into this, I'm like, I kind of care more about solving this case. Yeah. Like, I don't, well, you get, you know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, definitely. I, I think what, what's interesting is that you're not like, you know, you know, you're not law enforcement, right? No. But you are an investigator. I guess. You know, you're not, yeah. not by, by trade or by title. Right. But like you are investigating this case. But because you're not, I, I, I almost feel like you probably have more of a connection when you're not like, the cop coming with a warrant and like kicking down the door. You're just like, oh, for sure. I'm trying to solve this so that, like, yeah, listen, I have my own motivations to make a show and, and all that. It's my job, but, but I also just like want to bring peace to this family or I want to know for my own curiosity or whatever. And I think that's what might lead to some maybe, you know, more having more access or getting yeah. more details or whatever. It's like sometimes I've, there's a reason why some of these true crime cases are being solved almost by the the alternative people right. rather than just traditional law enforcement. People don't like cops. Yes, and they're not going to fucking talk and to you, you know? And especially cops who didn't solve this case. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, right. I mean... He's, fuck these guys. Yeah, you know? they're like, fuck these guys. Yeah, like, especially anybody a small is, town. Like, yeah. It's just so, like, non-traditional. And so many people... I mean, everyone knows what podcast is in New York City, but out in not out there. Browning, Montana, it's still like, what is a podcast? Yeah. And so, I, I'm just a complete nobody. Like... Which I try to use to my advantage. I mean, you're also though a a very. I'm sure you, you look very different from what oh, everybody I, in I there. I probably town. look insane out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And and that to me, I could either see being like, get this boy the fuck out of here. It's or, both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, because you know I, I'm listening to like the latest episodes where it's just audio of you getting out of the car and introducing yeah. yourself and. Clearly, just by dialect and accent, they're like you know you, you can tell these are two very different people mm -hmm. talking, and you know I'm like, are you worried at all when you do these things? I mean, only in certain moments. In that moment, I was kind of worried because I just had heard some at Sam McDonald's. bad yeah, yeah bad stories about the guy. I was walking on his property, like could he say that I was trespassing or something? And right. Just, fucking shoot me. It's a different world out there. And he had a gun, yeah. and he pulled it out. And, I, and it, so my instinct immediately was just to almost pretend like I knew him mm -hmm. and like kind of throw him off with that. Like, right. hey, bud. Sam, like, what's yeah. up, man? Like, right, right. Where he's thinking like, wait, do I know this guy? Interesting. And before he's even getting to that point, I'm like, I'm just like spitting out word vomit. Like, oh man, it smells nice out here. <laughs> like, he's like, who the fuck is this guy? Was that like And inside I'm like, fuck. Was that just a, a, a like a adrenaline reaction? Or 100%. Did you, you yeah. didn't have like a game plan going in? Not really. Because that's found if I overthink bold, it, man. I just, I, I'll fuck it up. Like, yeah. I mean, obviously I'll have some things in my head like, if my, okay, if, if he asked this, here's my answer to that. Right. There's like one or two things. Right. The rest is kind of just freestyle. The rest is just like feel it out and just Shit. try to be honest with him and maybe he'll be honest with me. You know? And that's, it feels like exactly what happened. Yeah. Like, and I'm not a threat, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm yeah. going to try to, I'm trying to, make you think that I'm not a threat either. I'm right. gonna try to, I don't have a gun. Right, so, yeah, like yeah. unarmed, you know. Right. <laughs> but man, you're walking up on somebody's property in Browning, Montana. That's always they've disgusting. they've literally stuff, got yeah. like the gun by their side, right? Mm -hmm. Like the yep. way he was holding it. I'd be like, uh, never mind, never mind guys. Yeah, <laughs> I was know? like, this is not good. Yeah. Uh, but then, shit, we talked for like an hour and a half after that. And so, and then I, I met with him again later, you'll hear, but yeah, like, yeah. Now he just talks to me. Do you ever have concerns about, in general, you know, people don't, you start getting too close to certain things. Yeah. I mean, you, you were a pretty integral part in hopefully solving the season one case, right? I mean, it's still, it's in, it's in trial. It's in right the now. headlines like that. Yeah. And people have given me so much shit, like, you didn't solve this case. I'm like, well, I never, I never said I solved this shit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I think that the proof is there that the suspect was listening to Up and Vanished and was likely, I mean, it's harder to keep a secret when everyone around you is talking about it. Mm -hmm. And in that town, I mean, Up and Vanished was huge at that time. And so this dude just felt, was just so narcissistic about, about it that he was like, he just started spilling beans to people. And then that got him caught. Bro, and that, I think to that me... was prompted by the podcast. But I mean, 
I didn't personally solve anything. No, you know, I, you know I'm not saying you know you kicked in the door and like right. cuffed the guy, but if if your podcast stems, you know, leads to him talking about it and mm -hmm. now being on trial, like that's fucking put one on the board for for pain. And that's and, the result I'm trying managed. to get. Like yeah. I'm I'm not expecting some person in an interview to say, you know what, I did it. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> even though I'd be like, imagine like you look at the camera, I'm like, cool, like, let's get the fuck out of here. That? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, mm, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's just not gonna happen. It may be dope, but yeah, like, yeah. what's likely going to happen is people are going to start saying weird shit because they're nervous and maybe they're changing their story or maybe like the right. FBI has the information I don't have yeah, and yeah. that just, they get tripped up. Right. The more they talk, the better. Right. You and, know? I mean, that's, and that's, that's the whole point. That's how police end up solving these things is you, mm -hmm. you, know, you inter interrogate enough and you talk enough and you find the missing piece and if you are doing it, and like we said, you're able to access different things because you're doing a different approach. Yep. You, know, you put that together... That's how you solve a fucking case. That's it. But, yep. you know, I'm sure there's plenty of police who don't want to give you credit, and I'm <sighs> sure, you know, they must. I mean, maybe, do, they, yeah. do, they, do they hate you? Cops must hate you. I feel like cops have hated me since I was, you know, <laughs> like fucking, fucking in high kid, school. Kid, like, smoking weed. Just, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Running away, <laughs> smoking a bowl on the golf course. Right, like, right. Just right. Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. feel like, I mean. There's always been a natural, like, I've never really liked <laughs> cops, cops either. Yeah. I've met a few that have been cool with, yeah. like, cases I've worked on, but most of the time, they're just like, they don't want anything to do with you. Right. I mean, they don't even like reporters, especially someone like me. Right. They're like, fuck this guy. And picking like, up a case that's like, you know, a lot of times you're almost trying to point out what the police fucked up or didn't right. catch the first time exactly. around. Exactly. So they're like, already guard that. up. Like, yeah, this yeah. guy's just going to talk shit about us. God, the like, moment that they're probably like, fuck, like, he confessed because of this. You know oh, I mean? yeah. Like, damn it, we got to give it, like, this is going to be the, the, the headline. Is I'm be sure they hate that. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny, though, because kind of, like the same way you, we were saying about you, like you have, you're making the podcast and you have an interest in solving the case for mm -hmm. like the good of it. Yeah. I'm sure, cops have the same idea too. It's like, sure. I want to find the bad guy, but I also want the collar. I want like, you know, I want it to be that I found him. Absolutely. So and yeah. those two things, it's like pain over here. If we, if we work with him, it'll help out, but also then we don't get the credit. So fuck that. And it's like, well, where's, where are your real motivations? They could solve so many more cases if they actually worked with someone like Just, myself. Ugh. And like I'm not even begging them to do that, but I just know just if I if I not? knew what you knew and you knew what I knew, we could probably just figure this out. But it's just for whatever reason, it, you well, guys it's change, man. It's it's changing, it's like, evolving. Get over it. Yeah, like come on. Did yeah. you watch Mindhunter? Yeah, on Netflix. Of course. Yeah. Right. So to me, like that, the idea where like they, they were the reason why people like, like law enforcement started doing mental and psychological, you know, mm -hmm. research on this shit. I think there's, like, it's time for, like, a new, you know, embracing a new way of, of uh, investigating crimes because, yeah. like, I think it was, uh, like, a, a couple weeks ago with, with the Gabby Petito case where they said, like, police are now employing, uh, you know, like, online investigators or something. Not meaning that they're, like, picking up idiots from Reddit, but, like, they're that like, they're... like, who's the podcaster <laughs> we're going to hire? <laughs> right. But utilizing some of this shit that, like, yeah, yeah. you know, does prove to be useful. It's like... Yeah, man, use, like, the internet and the networking and the, you know, like, that will help you in yeah. this case rather than just doing the old CSI shit, you know? Have, you know, swallow your pride, you know? They just, they just always keep, like, they never share information. Right. To anybody. Right. But they'll let a case go unsolved forever. I know. And they're I, like, it's an open investigation. I'm sure they like, have no, some reason. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's only open if someone's fucking it's working like on it. It's like, you just haven't solved it yet. Yeah, yeah, it's closed it. over there. You don't want to talk about it. Yes, that's yes, because it looks okay. bad for you. Yeah. But yeah, if you just, like, co cooperate a little more. I mean, that, the t to me, the, the, like, gold standard, and I'm sure it's, uh, I think I ended up reading several years later that it was a little bit of, like, movie magic, was the jinx where Robert yeah. Durst, like, just confesses in the urinal. Yeah, um, amazing. Which I, I think they said, uh, you know, at, it didn't quite unfold directly the way that it appeared on, on tape or on the screen or whatever. But nonetheless, it was like, you know, that, that episode where they were talking about, like, we have this evidence and we have to give it to the cops. Yeah. Has to be the most unbelievable feeling as a true crime <sighs> investigator being like, we've got it. Like, yeah. Got I mean, letter. that's like, the... that's the goal. Like, yeah. uh, everyone wants that jinx moment. Yeah. If you're investigating a cold case and, making right. a podcast or a documentary about it, you want there to be an ending, and you want the ending to yes. be that it's solved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully by them just fucking up and hanging themselves. Uh, you know I, mean? I mean, you know, 
Robert Durst, what a fuck crazy dude. But you can tell that, you know, he like wanted to, t- he, it's like, he, yeah, wanted, it's like, he was going to confess all, all along. Yeah, yeah. Why would you sign up for this? You're a fucking murderer. Because there's some compulsion in there that there is. you want to yeah. get it off your chest or you want to get credit or whatever. They want to stay close to, they want to stay close to you. It's yeah. like the, keeping yeah. the enemies closer kind of thing too, I think. That, they feel more in control that they're not going to get caught by yeah. participating in their selective way. Right, right. Yeah, it's like it's like if I ignore it totally, like you know, my backfire. That but maybe be, I can control the narrative. Weird. Here. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you had you had been working on. You had already started when the Jinx was out, or no? The Jinx was like part of your inspiration. It was part of my inspiration. Yeah, I had just that's, finished that's, the Jinx, and that really like seeing that moment. I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta do something like this. Yeah. To me, it was serial as an audio product. Mm-hmm. The Jinx as a video that was like. Yep, it was those two for me. And it's yeah. funny that I think still that's the gold standard for both genres, both Absolutely. mediums. Like you would think that you know that was the first one, and then we're gonna get them. They're gonna be better, and and there's some good ones, but I don't think either any of them. They're really definitely the holy grail at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, although I did get a kick out of Don't Fuck With Cats. I actually never watched that one. Really? Yeah. I mean, I've heard it's amazing. So yeah. you should watch it because first of all, what I like is it's quick. It's like it? three or four episodes. They're like 70 to 90 minutes, so like a little bit longer of episodes. Okay. But they're not like, you know, I remember watching The Staircase was, by the time I went to Netflix, it was 13 episodes. That was insanely was long. long. Bro. <laughs> and he I, totally I, did it, right? Oh, I mean, that was, that was like, the main one where I was like, if you did an ounce of research, it was like he took out a life insurance policy the day before she ended up dead. Mm-hmm. And the, the producers like loved the guy. It was like Still so a weird skewed. story. And a also fun. just the coverage they got of this person while it was happening. That was, to Will me. Will that ever even happen again like that? That was Probably what was not. fascinating. You're watching yeah. this guy walk around his, his living room room the day what before even his is trial this, yeah. and you know that that was what was intriguing did you ever hear did you ever hear the uh the owl theory i did yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's pretty good theory hey I mean, <laughs> you know, I it's it. one you might yeah. as well give it a shot yeah throw it out there in court but you know 13 episodes that was just like all right we get it but yeah, don't fuck long. with cats was one where you know i think a same sort of thing a lot of people want to say that this these forum like these chat room friends solved the case and mm-hmm. I don't think it was exactly that I think they helped in certain ways but they definitely found out a lot of shit like, yeah, yeah. and I don't know whether that you know got to the police because of them or right around the same time or whatever but it's amazing what you can solve by crowdsourcing and by talking about it and you know like there was uh, just a still shot of a room and there was like some sort of logo on a wall and like they look at like, that company and they, yeah. Yeah, they zoom in and it's like, yeah, when you get, you know, thousands of people uh, looking at this, anything can happen. And I think that's what's interesting about when you have a show like yours mm-hmm. that you know is going to get a lot of ears and eyeballs. Yep. Like, do you go into it now thinking, I'm going to have to, are you kind of writing the story as you go now? Because I feel like it's, now it's going to change by the time you get to episode 10. Right? Yeah, I because mean, because people um, maybe people come forward. Yeah, the news starts to cover it. Like in season one, the guy starts talking. Now it's like, well, I think it's going to play out this way, but it might be totally different by the time we get there. Yeah, I mean, I, I have an ending. Like I have an outline that has not really changed too much, but so much has changed since I started doing this. And certain players have opened up to me and kind of changed one my perspective of what may have happened, mm-hmm. and it's definitely going to change everyone who's listening perspective as well and so I just I like to leave the door open because you know it's still ongoing I don't know what happened right but I know that there's a finite amount of people that likely did this yeah and so the more I talk to those people and the more they tell me the more I cross-check you know someone is bound to either trip themselves up or who knows? Or maybe someone else comes out of the woodwork and says, "Oh, that's not true." And right, you like know, this episode. And they come I to me. To this and episode. It's like, yeah. So like that. I want to leave it open for that. I, I think that's uh, it's a good like rule. I would imagine to not become. You know, what do they say about the journalists? Like, you don't even make the story about yourself, right? It's mm-hmm. like the, the yeah, golden yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's important here, where it's like. You know, I wanted it to be Sam McDonald, but then I talked to him and like, oh, okay, never mind. Right, right. Got to be open-minded, which is something that a lot of people in media, all forms of media, don't have today. Oh, no way. You know? Yeah. I mean, we see it all the time just in the silly shit. It's like, I think this team is bad, and they start winning. Well, <laughs> no, it, it, you know, it, it, it's smoke and mirrors. It's not real. Right, yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. And you're just digging your heels in. You mean like my hawks? Like, yeah, yo. Hey. <laughs> so, yeah, you're an Atlanta guy through and through? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Which, I, I, I would not look at you and say Atlanta. 
Really? What would you say? I don't know. Maybe, I don't know what I would think. I would think more like, I feel like you look like a New York guy. Actually? Yeah. All right. I feel like I could be like Brooklyn. Have like, you like really been to Atlanta no, though? that's the thing. I was about to say I'm being completely like, <laughs> completely uh It's like, uh, it's definitely not like, I mean, it's, it's dope. It's like, it's a super progressive city. We, and we went down for the Super Bowl. Uh, okay. But we've stayed in like Buckhead. We weren't like really in like the city. Yeah. Um, so I was about I'm to I'm not like, like in the sticks. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I can show you where that is though. I mean. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. That might be that way. That's more what I'm thinking <laughs> of. But, uh, but yeah, so you grew up, grew up in Atlanta? Uh, well, like outside or, of it. Outside like, of Atlanta, yeah. yeah. But like been there basically your whole yeah, life. Yeah, been there my whole life, yeah. And you start out. Uh, as like what what kind of kid are we doing? Are you playing sports? Are you more into like music? Are you acting? Are you <laughs> skateboarding? You know what do you? Where? I mean, I play like rec basketball and yeah. stuff. Uh, right. But I mean, in like middle school, I got a video camera and I was like always you know filming my brothers and sisters and making movies. Okay, so and, it was there. And then through high school, doing that and music and stuff. But back then, it it wasn't like cool to be the artsy kid or something. Mm-hmm. Now it's like. Just like almost the norm, I feel like. But where I was from in Kennesaw, Georgia, it wasn't cool to be no. the movie making kid. No, you're, you're, yeah, you're the. <laughs> so you're I the didn't nerd. like. I wasn't like the popular kid by any means. But I knew everybody, and I just I, I was kind of an introvert, but like extroverted moments there. Okay, I still am that way. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's like that's. I don't know if that even yeah, makes any sense. There's but. been like a flip. I feel like from when we grew up. Of like, if you look now, what used to be nerdy, mm-hmm. comic books and fucking fantasy books and shit, right. that's now king. You know, that rules yeah. supreme across all pop culture, yeah. all media. And I think sort of the same thing with like, you know, it used to be like the jocks. And now, you know, yeah, if, you, if you're the kid who like can fucking edit on Premiere and make like dope videos, people are like, that's yeah. fucking awesome, yep. you know? But not when we were growing up you not know? at all no. no but it's interesting to see that uh that people had you know when people there was there was signs of you being like oh that was the kid who always had a camcorder in his hand like, oh for sure trying like, to make a movie trying to film a thing you know and you and yeah working in that all world. my parents friends and family were like oh he's gonna be famous one day yeah and like i was like and maybe and then are. i got in my late 20s i was like maybe not i was like <laughs> <laughs> and like that's like about the time where i was like man fuck this yeah. like i need to do something big because i almost i felt like because I was from like a smaller town and like I was the kid who did that kind of stuff. Yeah. I felt like I almost needed to live up to what I could be, you right. know? And I felt like, at, like right at the time I made up in Venice, I was kind of like, man, I just, you know, I'm kind of a failure here. Like, right. maybe not in some people's eyes, but like I wanted to make movies. I wanted to do that was, big Hollywood shit. You that know? was like personal in your head? That was personal in my head, or, yeah. But was there enough talk from parents and other friends that you thought well, it was like, around the I time where like there. you know my friends were getting married and you know I had a girlfriend at the time I've been with for a long time and they're all like are you gonna put a ring yeah. on it and I'm like I don't know dude I, I, I last episode I did uh, was just talking about the way people get caught up with checking boxes like mm-hmm. at the right time when you're young 20s you do this when you're late 20s you do this early 30s you should be here by now with this and that the house the kids or this oh, yeah. and you feel like compelled to check it off and if you're doing it just to check the box it's probably not going to work the, you know? the funny thing is is that I legit fell I fell in the trap mm-hmm. like I made up and vanished and I think it was an episode 4 or 5 and we were just starting to get a few sponsors but I'm talking like making a couple hundred bucks an episode. Really? But I was like, oh, it could make money. But I was like, well, this is great. People love it. But like, this isn't a career move. No. So I literally took a job interview as like this video editor. And I thought I was completely overqualified for it. Uh And I didn't get the job. (laughs) And I was like so pissed. I was, I responded in the email. I was like, who are you looking for? Fucking fucking JJ Abrams? I was like, (laughs) (laughs) and then literally right after that, it started taking off, and I was like, I cannot <laughs> fuck this up. Yeah. So there was a huge part of me that was like, I don't care what it takes, mm-hmm. I have to make this shit work. And so when you made it, it was it was just like a Payne Lindsay Tinderfoot production. It was. So I, I no... did a bunch of music videos back in the day, and there was this artist named August Salcina. I don't know if you remember who that guy was. Mm. He's kind of fallen off, whatever. Uh, and I did a bunch of videos for him, almost all his videos, and his manager, is actually my business partner now. His name's Donald. But like, he was just somebody I trusted in the creative industry who I felt like 
manage manage talent and like could maybe do some things that I wasn't as good at. Mm -hmm. So early on when I was making up in Vanish before it was out, I showed it to him and he was so sick of the music industry. And we both kind of just quit at the same time and just started just figuring this shit out. Cool. And now here we are. But it's just kind of crazy that that's, that's how we met, you know? The, the, the serendipity of it all, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I feel like uh, a lot of these things is all about timing. It is. Uh, who you meet, when you meet them. And if it falls, you know, if you hadn't met that guy or if he didn't become, you know, disenfranchised with it and like all at the same time, who, who knows if it never. Timing is, is almost everything. But, you know, like something like Siri has had NPR behind it. It has this like fucking machine, right? Yep. You, yours was just like, you know, the, the same people that we, you know, kind of make fun of now. Everybody's got a podcast. So one of right, other. Yeah. You were just kind of one of I those guys. I was one of those, that, for sure. Yeah. And, and it and so what what was the tipping point for you? Do you remember a moment where you were like, whoa, this is this is gonna be something life changing? There was like several moments. I remember I mean, the first one it, I released episode one and in one week I had five thousand downloads and I was like Holy shit. I was like, mm -hmm. that's more friends than I got on Facebook. Absolutely. I'm killing it. That's a number that, <laughs> uh, you know, people might not realize, but like when you're just yeah, fucking like, around starting out, that's a number. I thought that, that was so pretty work. cool. Yeah. And then like slowly over time, like I say like three, four months later, hundreds of thousands. And then there was shit. a point where within six months we were at like 10 million. And we were celebrating every downloads, single like... like Landmark. We were like, oh yes, a million, two million. Like, so I didn't know what the ceiling was Bro, for that's a popular podcast. Like, I, I didn't know. I was like, where, you know, how many listeners are even out there? I don't even know what the ceiling is in podcast success. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, when they say you know th this number was floating around for a, a, a lot of years now, like that twenty, I think it's like twenty five percent of America has listened to a podcast or something. Is it? Like, yeah. That's a fucking, that's, a that's, quarter of the country. It's a, a lot. huge fucking yeah. number. You yeah. tap into even a fraction of that, you're talking about a lot of people. But even the way you just threw that out there was pretty cavalier for some of the numbers you're talking about. Like, yeah. I thought you were going to say 5,000 and then we went to like 20,000 and then, you know, we, we got like on the local news and that bumped us up a little bit. But, it sounds like it pretty quickly was into the millions. Well, it's which crazy. Is pretty, we were like, at, I think like, like 15 million downloads at like episode 11. Are you talking total or like per total. episode? Total. Okay. Like, so like right. almost like a million each, which yeah. was a lot. And then, ton. then it was a huge break in the case. And it was, it was already popular at that point, but that's what really sent it mm -hmm. all the way. Mm -hmm. And that's when all the like, Good Morning America people came out of the woodworks so like, let's talk to the podcaster guy who mm -hmm. helped solve this. And everyone's like, mm -hmm. you didn't solve it. And I'm like, God, whatever mm -hmm. guys. But I decided, I was like, okay, I can either just let go of this case and just end it here or keep covering it. And so I made 12 more episodes yeah. like during the mess of the law enforcement like arresting people and new stories about them coming out. And really to me, the second half of season one is the craziest yeah. because now we know who to focus on and it's just kind of nothing else like it. And I've really never experienced anything else like that since then. Yeah, that, I mean, that is probably, I would imagine it started out, like you said, Local people were kind of obsessed with this case, right? Yeah. And from whatever there, maybe word of mouth or the power of the internet, you, you get outside the bubble a little bit. Mm -hmm. But something like a crack in the case or, or <clears throat> new evidence or whatever it may have been, again, timing, or it's just. Yeah. And then the timing of somebody like Good Morning America is, is thinking, like, oh, let's get the new, like, hip podcaster on because exactly. that's what's hot in the streets right now, right, exactly. right, Maria? Like, and it's like, you're right, now. Chuck. Yeah. You've heard of this, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Instead of just talking to the same old, you know, police and law enforcement or <laughs> yeah. the same old newspaper writer, well, now it's a podcaster. <laughs> yeah. And it's annoying and corny to people like us, but it's fucking huge to get on that. Like, when you, when you become a household name, like, you know, my... My parents are never going to listen to a podcast like ever again, but knew about Serial. You know what I mean? Certain exactly. Things that, yeah, yeah. You know, just they, they, they call it, you know, their radio program. You know, they're not <laughs> even thinking of it as a podcast. But all of that comes together. And, and so by the time you're doing a million an episode, sponsors have got to be banging down your door, right? Yeah. That was also like, we were at a point where, I mean, it was like stupid. And we're like, we can't stop making this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was gonna say, the thought that you even considered, I'll just maybe let this and one they, go. And they were oh. like, you can't stop making this. And yeah. so, I mean, it wasn't just for the money. Like, obviously, I, I mean, we learned so much in the second half of the season, and I'm, yeah. no regrets. But it was really difficult, because I was really making it week to week. 
and making on the fly, like right? yeah. on the fly and like making like buttoned up episodes with music that had like a story arc and yeah. not just like me talking, talking on the mic, you know. No, that, and that's like to me the polished production is what makes it. Like the information could be cool, but the sounds, the music, the eerie, you know, shit, mm -hmm. the podcast clips is what separates it from just being like a guy talking. So you gotta focus on that part of it. And and so was the sec the second half was it like was it like we're done. And then, oh, wait a minute, now we like reopen the podcast in a way? Or it just happened to be that like as you were doing it, the news broke and you could kind of like s smoothly do it. It was like episode 11 going into episode 12 and I was saying that we were going to take a break for like, and I didn't know if it was going to be a, a permanent break or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm still no working break. on it. It was so funny because I was like, I had finally gotten ahead too. I was like, man, I'm going to, had this episode done a few days early and just be able to have a weekend. No. Nope. Nah. And I was just in my office and then someone texted me and was like, hey, did you hear that there's gonna be a press conference today? Uh, and then just from that point forward, I just started getting calls from everybody. I was like, oh shit, what's yeah, happening? Yeah. Drove down to Osceola, they made, they made an arrest. Shit. And I'm like, holy shit, this is definitely not over. Yeah, no, it's just begun, really. You and know? it really did, it's like it yeah. was reset. And you're doing, Everything still at that point? You're, yeah, you're I mean, like, and I had a little your... bit of help from uh, this company called Resonate Recordings, one of my friends who, like, mm -hmm. just does editing. But other than that, it was me. And, like, back then I edited in Adobe Premiere yeah. all the audio because I only knew video software, and I was resistant to learning a new program because it yeah. just takes forever. Right. I use Audition now. But, like, I was just editing everything in this video software program, and it was just me. And that's crazy. I was sourcing all the music, and it was yeah. just crazy. See, that's to me what makes the story amazing. Is like, because again, if if it was like serial with NPR, it's like you'd had the money and the resources. And mm -hmm. This was destined to be a big hit. It was never sure, going to yeah, be a yeah. failure. This was just like, you know, your your own determination, uh, a microphone and a pair of balls. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. I'm gonna just do this because, you know, like had you had a cushy job. Do you think you would have done this? Had your music videos no. popped, would you have done this? Mm -mm. Right? It's you almost need. I had. I was like. Uh, I was at a point where I was like completely fuck it. Yeah. And I took a big risk. And my what I was worried about the most was actually stepping on the toes of people who really were radio people. I just totally like identified as a filmmaker, even though I hadn't made any movies. <laughs> I was just like, I'm a, I'm a video guy. You're like happy guy. I'm not a radio I'm a guy. Player, I don't man. have a don't... voice for this shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like, you I do, realized, by the way. It turns out, I, I guess I sort of do, but yeah. like, I, I never really thought that. And I felt like I was just like a, a complete imposter mm -hmm. by like saying, well, I have a podcast now. Yeah. But I learned that it just doesn't fucking matter. Like, it, 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 it doesn't, uh, I don't think it can like, I don't know. Does it matter? I guess not really. If your story is fucking great, I mean, but I, it's like sometimes I think about my. Doesn't own mean voice. that it's not going to suck. Someone might make something that is yeah. really bad, but like I think that people don't really like. I was just caught up in my own self perception that yeah. didn't really Does it matter. Fucking matter. Yeah, you get you a little narcissistic about it, where it's like, yeah, yeah, because it's so like for me, I, I was holding myself you, back. You know, yeah, yeah. But it's funny. Like I, you know, I mean, I've been talking for so long, so often, and. You know, there are people who don't like my voice or don't like the way I say things <laughs> right. or an accent or whatever. And I was even <laughs> thinking about like had I, had I done a show like yours because mm -hmm. I got a little bit of a New York accent and sometimes like and I say Mario, not Mario. They'd probably dig it. To and be they, no, they go. My fans Do they? fucking hate. Do they? Okay. It. And then well. when I'm listening to the season, there's uh, Mario's Facebook or whatever, right? The guy's name is Mario posted on Facebook. <laughs> and I'm like, Mario, and I'm thinking like, oh my God, if I was saying like, you know, <laughs> like people, nobody would be even, even talking about the fucking case. They'd just be talking about me and my voice. I didn't but know again, you were saying for a second. I was like, Mario. Mario yeah, exactly. Oh, Mario. Mario. Like, and I, I say Mario <laughs> and the world can't, can't get over it. And uh, I'm just thinking like nobody would even care about the, the disappeared girl, the, the missing girl. At least you'd stand out. Voice. It'd be funny at times. <laughs> <laughs> but it, Comic it, relief. It, it, it is like the perfect storm of, of all that shit, I, I do think, where uh, you had the, the mentality to do it the way you did it. And like, thank God you did. Because if, if, if it was like, you know, and this is interesting, but like, I got a deadline for that music video that from this big band that is going to pay me a decent amount of money, so I can't do it. I'm telling you, I was there, and I, and I took a job interview. I was ready to just say, 
you know what, fuck it. I'm just gonna be the guy who clocks in and clocks out. Really? 100%. What kind of job? It was a video editing job. Right. And then I didn't get it. And oh, that, that was like, that, yes. yeah, and that okay, was like the okay. biggest fuck you yes, to me. And I was yes. like, you know what? Mm -hmm. Fuck all this. Mm -hmm. And like that really just like full sent me. But like had I got that job and maybe stopped taking the podcast as seriously, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't be here talking to you about this. Yeah. Which is terrifying to I think know. about. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of, some, in, a, in a little bit of a way, it's like discouraging where the, the bright side is you can start a podcast and just run with it and it True. might work. The, the, the other side is kind of like, it's got to be the, the perfect storm of like, I was down and out. I didn't have a paycheck. I yeah, need yeah. to be motivated. And you can't, because you can't fabricate that. No. If you do have a nice job, you you have a nice job. You you're, not, you're not gonna risk. have that hunger. You're not gonna have that. Everyone's too scared to take risks, yeah. and I get it. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I was too. Now it's like I love taking risks, and like yeah. I, I, if I well, don't wait, take now, a risk, yeah. But did you risk it though? Because like you, it was more like you. Well, didn't it have... felt like a risk to me. Yeah. Like it, it wasn't like looking back. It's like, well, was it really that risky? Not really. Right. But it felt like I was stepping out on a limb. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm gonna make a podcast, and also like, what the hell was someone like me doing looking into a murder case yeah now that's like totally acceptable absolutely but, but not back idea. then it was like no you don't who are you again right. like yeah right. I, and i'm like i don't know should, maybe I, I should not do this how, <laughs> how do you guys even like uh, i can understand if you word of mouth know some people and they ask to talk but like are you asking for uh like are you doing like freedom of information act type shit are you doing that kind of like if research? i can yeah, yeah i mean like there's only so much of that information out there in a case yeah. like this like with season three I mean, the FBI has all this stuff on lock. Like, they had one conversation with me, honestly, I think just to appease me, and so mm -hmm. they didn't, so I didn't say in the podcast that the, the FBI, FBI. won't talk to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> So yeah, they did yeah. that, but, uh, right. yeah, I don't know. I, I, to me, like, the best thing is just talking to people and, mm -hmm. like, getting the people that really don't want to talk or haven't talked to talk. Yeah. And then that opens up all the doors. It sounds like you got that gift of making people comfortable. I've gotten better at it over yeah. time. And now I'm just more tenacious about it, where I'm just like, okay. Let's go. Maybe when I was like a little bit he more hesitant, now I'm like, no, I'm gonna press a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, it's gonna be fine. But there's that 1% <laughs> chance. But like, odds are, like, no one's gonna really kill me. Now, is it possible? Fa famous last words in case is something bad Is it possible? Happens? Yes. <laughs> but like, yeah, chances of you becoming uh, another missing person. And if that's how I go, then like, you know what? There would be a there'd I'm, be an epic documentary. I'm later, picking up the podcast. You know, then. like I'm doing a podcast about your podcast. <laughs> yeah. Downloads. If you disappear, it'd be a dope Netflix series. You should series. fake your own death. Downloads will fucking quadruple. Oh yeah. If I went X. missing for sure. But if then if I was banished, like up just banished? kidding, I would just be banished from oh, forever. Yeah. But you got you have to like make all your money then because you're never making another dime yeah. ever again. Because <laughs> uh, there, there is there, there is that point. Uh, there is like that that uh, trust. You know, like, mm -hmm. you do. Do you ever feel like you're almost like a little bit puppet masterish? Uh, to a degree, um, but like I don't want to like lean too much into that because yeah. then I start being like, like I found that if I want someone to be vulnerable with me, I genuinely need and have to be vulnerable with them. Mm -hmm. And so like I'm not going to ask somebody a question that I'm not prepared to answer personally as well. Yeah. And so like I really do try to open up to these people and you know, not be a puppet master, but at the same time, if someone is a person of interest and I feel like they're playing a game with me, then right. I'm going to figure that out mm -hmm. or try to figure that out mm -hmm. and, you know, get ahead of that. Yeah. So if that's puppet mastery, then sure. That's, you know? that's like, a, you know, a skill that I think a lot of people, when you think about what, what most people fear of like public speaking or they're afraid of confrontation or mm -hmm. they don't like si awkward silence, yep. like that's where you're going to have to thrive. You're going to have to confront people. You're going to have to ask them the tough questions. You're going to have to, a lot of nonverbal, like I know what you're thinking and I think, and you know that I know what you think I'm thinking. You know, a lot of that like cat and mouse game that is, it's a little bit lawyerish. It's a little bit debate-ish. It's a little bit interview. Like it's everything that maybe comes to you naturally or you realize you've honed a little bit, but I think a lot of people out there can't even fucking do it at all. I think I got better at it by accident because early on I was, I was, would just be looking at them and, and thinking about what my next question is, right? Mm -hmm. And right before I would get it out, we had sat in like seven seconds of silence and people hate that. Hate it. And then they just start talking and I'm like, uh, and then I just kind of was like, okay. I'm gonna let you do your thing. And I just, yeah. turns out that people, 
Like, and that's like an old school trick that like uh, any journalist would probably tell you. Definitely. But it's true. It's, it's real. like, yeah, it's real. And again, like, in. I mean, I even do it too. Like, I, I want to fill the silence too. Oh, you know? I'm always, people are always saying, like, stop it's talking. It's human nature. Like, don't talk over your guests. You're talking too much. And it's like, I'm just fucking, I'm just, we're going to talk. Yeah, it's like. He stops, I'm going to talk, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I think that, you know, when you're, if you're like on trial, I think your lawyer is going to uh, tell you, like, and don't worry about, like, a few minutes, of si a few seconds of silence. It's, it's okay. Yeah. But you're not, you know, you're just, you, these people have invited you into their living room, and they feel a little awkward, and they're mm -hmm. like, okay, I'll just keep telling you about that night. And, you know, I'll tell you where I was then, and it's yeah, like, yeah. You let them hang themselves in a way. Yep. That it, it's all a skill that, whether or not you realize it, like, you've probably been, like, really perfecting it over the years. Now, the, the thing that I thought was interesting, like what I said earlier, is, like, that up advantage keeps delivering, you know? Are we are we planning on a, a season four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Are we? Is there a number on it? I uh, mean, it's funny. Uh, after season two, I was so just like beat up by doing true crime stuff and just exhausted that like I'm pretty sure I told everybody that I worked with like I'm never making up and vanish ever again. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are. So that's that was I'm true. never drinking again. And then <laughs> exactly. Thursday night rolls just like that. Yeah. Um, so I would imagine yes. Like there'll be a season four. Probably a five. Uh, I don't know exactly where it goes from here, but I think that I mean I, I did feel the pressure of like thank you for feeling that I that it is delivering for a third time. But like I'm like if this shit just sucks mm -hmm. or or just is or we learn nothing, then like that's just like that's a scary pressure. You yeah, know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, I would be terrified. I don't want that. It's easier just to not do it and be like let it let it live. Look, look what I did awesome in the past, thing. right? Yeah, but like that's yeah. not that's not cool. So like. Yeah, I uh, I feel the pressure to make it better every time, even if that's not what happens. Or yeah. I, I want well, what to strive for that. You're a little bit at the mercy of available, if that's the right word, cases. You know, yeah, like, like the first one you picked had resonated with this town, and you know, it's this, it's like this pretty white girl teacher in the right neighborhood with mm -hmm. the right, uh, you know, uh, interest and. I actually commend you for taking on the most ignored of all cases. Yeah. Because there, you know, there could have been every chance that listeners were like, eh, like Native American uh, reservation, right. never, like, don't care about that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you almost took like the the hardest thing to make popular and you're making, uh, these are bad words to use popular. No, but I know I'm what you're saying. Talking about death and murder and shit. But, you know, it's like you you were like, I'll, I'll go do the thing that doesn't get a lot of attention because it deserves the attention. Yeah, and I didn't want to do it in some boring or like aggressive NPR way where it's like you should know about this if not you suck yeah like, very preachy so I wanted to be like yeah. you know this this thing moved me like this story moved me these people moved me I'm like how can I translate that to where anybody listening would feel the same way mm -hmm. and maybe someone who I, I don't want to preach to them because mm -hmm. I'm not even the guy who would preach to you about this anyways right just listen to their stories and you know it only felt right for me to use the platform that up and vanished is now to cover a case that wouldn't get that kind of attention. Right. Or else what the What's hell the is point the point of, of this? making it? Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. I, I mean, I do definitely, uh, it's so obvious now, you can't even deny it, that every case that goes mainstream mm -hmm. is, you know, a pretty white girl from yeah. uh, affluent town. And yep. I mean, but I also hate the flip side where now people are like, why? Why do you care about Gabby Petito? Why aren't you talking about this, right. this Native American girl? It's like they're equally well, as we're not tragic trying, here. Yeah, yeah, we're not going to one up each other with the tragedy level here. Yeah, but it is obvious that this these are all the elements that make Nancy Grace go fucking wild. You Absolutely, know? Like, it's the People magazine up, cover. Like mm -hmm. Nancy yep. Grace wakes up like, yes, I'm happy this is happening because <laughs> I got like I got hours to film. Hundred yeah. percent. But uh, when you see a a case like that or something that goes mainstream. Or stumble upon another. Uh, do you, uh, do you feel compelled to like do it, or like, oh, I would have done it this way, or here's how I would have, or is it just like, I'm more like that's what I do, and that's something separate. I'm just like, here we go again. Yeah, you know, like, you, yeah. this is our latest fascination as mm -hmm. a country. Um, and then what's funny is that Gabby's case really kind of started underscoring the lack of attention that Native American cases were getting. And Up Advantage has been out for about a month, mm -hmm. and then that's what all these different outlets started just banging on my door and I was like what in the world I'm like really? yeah. oh is it po oh it's cool to talk about now uh -huh. oh yeah I guess I'll talk to you because I should right but I'm like that 
bothers me a yeah, little bit. That's you a know, little, like you're just jumping on this bandwagon. I gotta get over it. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, and you think that was all tied to to that case? You think like it became? I think I think so. I mean, in the sense, of at like least like one a, of the main reasons, like like a producer of, of a, is is thinking like, okay, what else can we? What more true crime shit can we talk about? And someone's like, oh, well, there's this. Well, the cover for Gabby's case is so this. insane. It's yeah. like so much mm -hmm. that I think that people started thinking like, why is this getting so much attention? Yeah. Not that it shouldn't be getting attention, but just like that much attention, I think, spotlighted all the cases that don't get any attention. And then you're almost making, you're putting the biggest spotlight on the on the cases that don't, that usually get the smallest spotlight, so you're the natural spot to go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. It's yep. almost like, yeah, you, you're kind of getting like, you're riding the wave of Gabby mm -hmm. Petito while not doing anything Gabby Petito-esque at all. So weird. Yeah. yeah. But what's weird is that the, the idea of like true crime cases, I think are almost getting mixed in with just police investigations. Like you pick a cold case. Mm -hmm. That is a true crime, unsolved mystery that we're revisiting, trying to reopen and figure out. Like, Gabby Petito was just like, it's happening in real time. That's, this is just a police investigation. Yeah, you know? it's just happening It's not like we're right looking, yeah. you know, re-examining, we missed a piece of no, evidence. No. It's just like, it's you are now just taking interest in what police do probably every fucking day. Yeah. And everything becomes, you know, it's not your favorite podcast. It's not your new Netflix series. It's just a police investigation that, you know, maybe you can help, but maybe you're going to hinder or whatever. Right. Or people, I, I, was, I was guilty of it. I'm tweeting out some theories and some jokes and I'm like wait a minute this is like I mean this girl like is probably dead <laughs> right her family like, like check myself here yeah, yeah. like I, you know is there is there ever do you, do you ever feel like you've crossed a line or has there ever been any feedback of kind of like you know you're using uh, my my daughter's death as a this or that or are you always very respectful of everything and I mean there's definitely no family member or someone who actually matters has ever thought or felt that way. Which is all that matters. Which is all that matters. Yeah. But there's definitely a bunch of trolls who are like, you're just capitalizing off, and I'm like, mm -hmm. whatever, dude. Yeah, like, fuck off. It's like, yeah, like, this shit is fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, man. And it's hard because I'm juggling real people's lives mm -hmm. and relationships that do matter. And, you know, that is, at the end of the day, more important than making some salacious podcast. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so... You know, it is always, and I feel that pressure, and, and like I try to be a better person about that as as I've grown into these shoes. Yeah, um, but it's not easy, and there's no perfect balance for it all. People are gonna get mad, yeah. always, 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 man. And, and I, I mean, I've felt it in in much a much smaller scale of like, you know, if I'm doing a video on Instagram for the day, and it's something that's. Uh, a little more like serious or touchy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna throw an ad in that. I don't want to like be like, and also use my po my promo code. <laughs> right, you know, little yeah. things that are like you you know you pick up on the subtleties of like when to do certain things mm -hmm. and, because it is you know if you if you do come across as the Alex Jones or Nancy Grace, right. where it's just like you you guys love this, don't you? You know, it's like right. I am making this. I do want to make it theatrical and interesting and intriguing. Yeah, but at its heart, is still like I'm I'm you're being respectful of it all. Yeah, I'm not the kind of guy who's like foaming at the mouth about the story anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I may get obsessed about little de details that I am trying to figure out and tell you in some sort of mm -hmm. way, but I'm not like getting off on it like right. you probably might think I am if you're just a hater. Yeah. It's no, not even I, like that. You almost can't be the fan. Like the fans are the ones who get obsessed. Exactly. If a fan were to be in your place, I think it would come across as like, too much, you know. Absolutely, they but you do it. seem to have enough of a like distance from it where yeah. you can do it rather than listen yeah. To they, it. They, the comments used to bother me, but now I'm just like, I mean, every now and then I'm like, look at this motherfucker. Yeah, but just because yeah. it feels good to yeah. like. <laughs> well, once you, you know, made it, you know, that's that's the difference. every now and then you gotta just you know feed the beast a little bit with a little yeah. You know, your comment. It is reading, interesting. But <laughs> sometimes they they do they know exactly how to cut you. Oh, you know? they do. So much of it is white noise and like bullshit. I've read a few but, where I'm like. He's right. Yeah, <laughs> and the ones where you're like, I do do that, or like, fuck, I'm I, like, I, yeah, you know. that's the ones I get mad about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what was it like? Uh, I mean, at this point, are you rich? Uh, what is rich these days? I don't know. It's hard to define. I'm not isn't broke. It? Yeah, not broke is a good word, a good place to start. Um, um, like, I mean, you know, when so, the sponsors started to roll in, was it like, holy shit? I'm yeah, I mean, gonna go let's buy put it this way. My house? life is completely different. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but like, I, I'm aspiring to, to be bigger and better than I am now. Yeah. And like, yeah. you know, 
I'm trying to build like my own little empire here with Tenderfoot and our right. shows and flip that IP and make TV shows and movies about that and mm -hmm. just like keep growing that way. And so I, I'm not even thinking about it that way. And like, yeah, I'm a hustler and like we're trying to, you know. What's next is always kind of on the It's front. always about what's next. Yeah, and yeah. yeah Do I mean, you take the time to enjoy it though? So I did it for a while and then mm -hmm. about a year ago, like right, kind of when the pandemic started, I was like at, in like just a bad mental place because I'd just been head down for so long mm -hmm. that I wasn't really even appreciating the shit that I had made for myself. And a very important I've thing gotten better at doing that the, in the last yeah. year. I think I've kind of like finally equaled out a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the longest time, I, I was not. I was just addicted to doing the next thing. And I was still kind of riding that train of like, you can't fuck this up. Because I was so scared of going back to having to apply for some stupid job again that I really like, mm -hmm. I just drilled it in my head that this is what I got to do. And I didn't realize that I was like destroying myself in the process mm -hmm. mentally by always being in that mode. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, okay, chill out. Like, yeah, you it, can enjoy this. A lot of the things that you're worried about, they'll get figured out. It's okay. Like, yeah, it's a big theme of, of my show here with what, comics or actors or whoever comes through where it's like, you strive to reach something, and then when mm -hmm. you do, you never soak it in. You never yeah. give yourself a pat on the back or a mm -hmm. moment to breathe. Yep. And I, I think it, you know, it, it is a hustler mentality. It comes from people who haven't had that taste of like rejection from that job you thought you were going to get, yeah. or reaching rock bottom where it's like, I don't, I don't have a paycheck, I don't got a dollar to my name, or you know, when you when that happens to you, and then you get some success. You're kind of like I gotta keep going because I never get back there, mm -hmm. you know. And if you if you if you get lucky or you have a connection or you're kind of born into it, you're never gonna have that feeling of like I can't go back. Yep. And so I feel like a lot of the people who who come from the right place often don't get to enjoy, you know, their spoils, and that's the shame yeah. because it's like yeah. you guys, you know, you deserve it the most. You you did it the right way. Yeah. Um, and I, I also think that you, if you don't. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally a do as I say, not as I do, because I never do it myself. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, like, spend some of that money or right. or enjoy some of that off time. You gotta live your life. You gotta live it and yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. Or else, what, or, else, or else you're just. And then you become. Only screw about yourself. It and <laughs> resentful about it. Yeah. You're never gonna wanna do it anymore. Um, but yeah, like, I would imagine when it went from a handful of listeners to a couple million. Yeah. And all of a sudden. And, and are you doing. You know, were you running all that as well? You're taking, like, you're setting your own rates and you're taking in the money, or did you, like, hire someone to handle all that? It's been, like, the craziest, like, I mean, I started off with this company called Audio Boom, you know, those mm -hmm. guys, mm -hmm. and, like, they were killing it, selling it, and then Open Vanity Season 1 was a huge hit, and so we ended up leaving Audio Boom and, like, took a big, huge minimum guarantee from another company mm -hmm. and then did some more shows with them, carved out a slate with iHeart, and then, and you're doing all this yourself. I mean, I have an agent, and like right. my okay. my business partner Donald is more of the business guy. Now, I I love that stuff too, mm -hmm. but like I'm definitely more the creative brain at the end of the day. Right. Um. But yeah, I mean, like this that stuff is exciting to me. Right. And so like, yeah, like that was always something that made that kind of validated all the the hard work that like made me feel crazy looking into a murder case. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. this is. At the end of the day, this is actually pretty dope. Like, mm. all this stuff over here. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, it's a balance. But, yeah, we've, at this point, we're, we have a few different partnerships. I mean, like, Audible, like, yeah. iHeart, Cadence 13. Um, and just, you know, we're just trying to make a, as many good shows as possible and, like, make that IP live as many places as, as it can. That's like, you game, know what I mean? Right? Like. Yeah. Get that executive producer tag on all, sure, all sorts yeah. of work and yeah. let that money roll. Uh, what about your personal life? Was that like, did, did, was there a drastic change in like just your your social life, your romantic life, your day to day oh, life? Oh man, like, yeah. Like you're now kind of a star, but mm -hmm. it's enough anonymity that you know you're, it's not like you right. Can't go They're to the not like store, on but, the street. Yeah. yeah. I mean, remember I told you that like I was feeling the pressure to get, you know, married to my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Well, oops, did that. Mm. And um, <laughs> okay. we're not married anymore. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, no ring, so get yeah. that. Yeah, um, I know that game. Did that. And it was, we both the timing was so strange <laughs> because we got married in September of 2016. Uh, Up and Vanish came out in August 2016. 
Oh, and, and that year was absolutely insane. And like we had lived apart and then we lived back together again. And it just immediately was just toxic mm -hmm. and not good. And on top of that, my podcast is blowing the fuck up. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time away from there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so did that for a year. Then I fell in love with another girl mm -hmm. and didn't do anything other than just actually start having feelings for somebody else. Right. That ended up becoming like a, a, br a breakup scenario. We got divorced and uh, yeah. And then I dated the other girl for a couple of years mm -hmm. and she worked with me. And so it was, it was good and bad in that way. Yeah, that's always like. Right, it was like, I mean, at I've first it was like so amazing. Then I'm like, oh, this is why you don't do You don't do, do it. That. Yeah, I've seen a few, uh, I know a few it. like celebrity couples mm -hmm. who do podcasts together or, or my wife produces for me or my husband yeah. helps me. And I'm like, and all of them are always like, it's, it's great. And I'm like, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah, now I, I know, I'm like, forever, I don't really want that exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I'd like for them to understand what I do and that like, I'm gonna do, you know, weird spontaneous shit sometimes and uh -huh, my job uh -huh. is not normal. That's a key, But I don't man. necessarily want you to do it with me. Yes, yes, you know? be understanding, but you know, yeah, it's you, part of it. You don't have to be it. here in the office with me every day. You know what's really tough whatever. too? And I, and I wonder if this is why a lot of times celebrities do link up with each other, mm -hmm. is like, if your girl or your guy is clocking in nine to five mm -hmm. and you're doing this, they're See, never gonna understand. They're never gonna get it. And they can try and, and you find a good one who who tries their best and, and accommodates, yeah. but to really understand where it's like, I mean, when, when Barstool was first coming up, it was like my life, it was everything for me. Of it course. Was like, I'm gonna leave leave the restaurant to go put this, I gotta go write this and put it on the website because it's breaking news. Yeah. And nights and weekends and sporting events, I can't go to the game, I have to cover the game and all these things that just weigh on a relationship where it's yeah. like, because you just don't get it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, it's like, the, it's a weird thing I was kind of in the same boat where you're getting married as things are changing drastically, mm -hmm. you know, and it's yeah. like she doesn't know that side of you or what life's going to be like with this new version of Up and Vanished. And yeah. I, I liked you better when you were, you know, filming videos and just had a hobby, not being a fucking superstar true crime investigator or whatever, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, I don't know what to yeah. tell you. Like, then we're, not, then we're not a right fit, you know? Yep. Did, you, did you ever try to, like, accommodate? And, I mean, it doesn't sound like the job itself was as much of a hindrance. Like for me, it was like, we're talking to girls, we're partying, I'm doing podcasts sure, yeah. about sex, and it was like, I don't like yeah, this. Yeah, like I definitely didn't have like any of those issues. Yeah. It was more like, oh, Payne's over there in his hole at, late at night and oh, one in the morning. Day. Yeah. And it's like. But so something like that. Just you... not around, because I was just, I mean, I was, it was just me, so it was even harder to put this show together. I bet, yeah. And I was just living and breathing it. Like yeah. literally waking up like, Going to sleep, waking up, thinking about the last thought I was thinking about before I went to sleep. Uh -huh. I'm like, yep, back on it. As she's it, trying to talk to you. And, yeah, and she's know, like, where and are, and like at first hey, it was hey, cool because everyone was like so excited and like it was like successful or becoming successful. And then it was like she just did not dig the fact that like I was not the same person who was laying around on the couch anymore or whatever. And Which is so, I mean, that's a sign that it, it's not exactly. a good thing. And it's like, the one for you is gonna be excited about that yeah. and, and supportive. Yeah. But yeah, that that vibe of like, like I, I wished I had said, this is the deal, it's gonna be like this. You don't, you don't, you out, you don't always you know? know what the deal is. No, and that is and, ever like, evolving. That's it's the thing, it's changing. like, yeah, yeah, now you look back in hindsight and can say that, but like mm -hmm. at the time you're like, you probably felt the same risk of like, I don't want to fuck this up either. Absolutely, like, absolutely. What's I think super interesting about our our industry and then specifically even yours further is like not many people, there's not much of a blueprint for this yet, you know? Not really, There's no. There's plenty of actors you can look back on if you're in movies and singers and stuff. And for me, it's like I can look at like some sports radio uh, personalities sure. and some Howard Stern But still, you guys things. aren't that and you aren't no, that. No, right. And so like I, I'm like there's, you know, only – two or three other people who are mostly here that I could ever say like, can actually understand what I'm going through. And even more so with, with you blazing that trail of, in the true crime world where it's like, you know, maybe Sarah Koenig could understand. I, you I can a, literally a, a relate to nobody and, about this. Yeah, shit. like there's nobody, right? You're the only one, which and is like, a pretty I've, cool I've thing. I've had to accept that. I'm yeah. like, you're never gonna really get it. You're gonna, you could have a decent idea, but you're probably still way off. Isn't that <laughs> fascinating to be like, you are doing something that technically has never been done before. 
in I'm the, making in, this shit up as I go. Human, in the, you know, in the history of humankind. Yeah. You're doing something that is so rare that only you know it's what it is. It's kind of strange. Uh, to me, what's funny is that true crime podcasts and like the true crime podcaster has become like a trope. Yeah, and I think, absolutely. I mean, I think it's hilarious. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. It is. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. But like, I'm a fucking trope. Like, when you're, but that, that's you know crazy. What, you know, like, do you know how you fuck? become a trope by being like fucking wildly successful? You I know guess. What I mean? Yeah. I mean, you're, like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, but like, we we always say like, you don't me. you don't have a brand until until people hate you. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That means it's made it so big when you can get spoof parody level. When you can get yeah. parody. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. because every it's it's ubiquitous. Everybody sees it and knows it. Right. So now they'll understand the trope. Exactly. There's no trope they without world yeah. widespread understanding. You know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, yeah, that's that's fascinating to be like. You know, I hope you recognize that. I hope you understand. That, like, yeah, you've done something on that level because that's no, it, fucking incredible. It's cool. I, mean, I, I think I do recognize that, um, and I appreciate like what I've built. But there's always that part of me that will probably never go away. Where I, I really like if I'm making a, a new show, I want it to be the best shit I've ever made. Yeah, and like, I think that like I have just doubled down, tripled down on that over time. Where like. I really want to make amazing shit. Mm-hmm. And like from a place that like maybe isn't even the most healthy, like I really want to go oh, do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, I'm like, but also like chill out and enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, I it's know. It's not that serious. It's balancing it's okay. those two things. Yeah. You know, some so, days like, you wake I'm up to as do one, that too. some days you wake up as the other. And exactly, you never and that's know. kind of what it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I noticed you said on uh, during this season that you, you, you think you suffer from imposter syndrome. Definitely. Is yeah. that in, in, in the sense of like, the investigation or your life in general? I think I think it goes in, like all from all aspects mm-hmm. of my life, but like even more so, like it was definitely like highlighted in something like me looking into a, a unsolved missing persons case and and talking about it with like some sort of authority. Yeah, right. And right. Like, like who the fuck am I? Yeah, I'm like yeah. you know, how, and like who am I? Who, who am mm-hmm. I coming across as to you? And like don't uh, don't get too much in your head about this mm-hmm. because you know. It's just, I, that's it another, can fuck you up. Another theme of mine I always talk about, it's such a fine line of like, I want to stay humble, I want to stay grounded. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of my appeal is relatability. Yeah. But also, part of me wishes that along the way, I used to like flex a little bit more and be like, I'm fucking killing it. I'm doing really? something that's like, because I, you know, we're, we're very self-deprecating around here. We're always busting balls. I'm kind of the same way. I'm always way. talking like, shit about myself <laughs> yeah. and crying yeah. to myself. And most people understand that's the case, but there's a large chunk of the internet and trolls and shit who, who jump on that and like yeah, they and, really and, want and, you to feel that. Yeah. And sometimes I wish I just said like fuck off, you know? Yeah. Uh, because you know, you, you, and, and in your case, it's undeniable. Like you, what you're doing is so fucking big and so popular that I mean, what uh, are the numbers ever growing to? Like I mean, we're still seeing season oh, yeah. three of for sure. Yeah. Sick. We're, yeah, we're, we're still growing. And now it's like with multiple shows too. Yeah. And now I've kind of built a network of shows. just like mm-hmm. you guys have, like not yeah. the same content or same amount probably, but. No, but uh, we're all but yeah, you know, every new show we have, we, we promote it on all of our pre-existing shows and like so, it's a machine. Yeah. But like for that to keep working, the next thing you do has to be good. Yeah. And not trash. Right, because, yeah, yes, like, absolutely. I mean, that's the pressure too, though. <laughs> Which is the pressure, right? Yeah. Fucking stops, man. Right. We feel it with like new new social media platforms and yeah. new everything. So it's like, you got Every it. podcast that's like, I'm starting over from scratch, going. it seems like, yeah. I'm like, here we go. Like, yeah. this might be the one that really sucks. Yeah, I gotta have a flop <laughs> sooner or later. Yeah. Exactly. What, what do you think has been like the biggest, uh, <laughs> biggest perk or biggest holy shit moment after, from doing all this? Have you, you know, you've been in a room with Certain people who you never thought you'd be with, or at a party, or a place, or with a with a woman, with a with a guy, a star, somebody. You're like, holy shit! I can't believe that that you know I'm here now. I mean, I was. Uh, let's see, this is like a year and a half ago, two years ago. I got a random call from like some number. I was in San Francisco at the time. But I was about to go back to Atlanta, mm-hmm. and it was like, hi, I'm so and so with Warner Brothers Studios, and. I'm the assistant for Ewan McGregor, and he wants you to come on set to Dr. Sleep and just chat with him. And I was like, what? I was like, is this for real? And I was like, all right, whatever. And so I went to the set, huge Up and Vanish fan, and then, so at the time I lived at this place called Pont City Market in Atlanta, and like a lot of the, I guess like the actors and stuff are put up there sometimes, mm-hmm. and he was literally staying above me in <laughs> my apartment. So we ended up like hanging out like wow. multiple times, like yeah. getting drunk, drinking wine, just having fun. Wow. And like 
Austin, and his daughter did these tattoos. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, so it's like shit like that, where just like yeah. random people like. Who may be celebrities, but like at the end of the day are just normal people. Right. Listen to podcasts. Absolutely. And like, that, that's what's cool. And to me, that? like, like they're like, oh, or to them, like I'm like the really cool guy. It's in their ears, and I'm like, but you're like an actual famous uh, person. Know. Yeah. That feels just funny. Like, to certain people in 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 this world, like Barstool fans, to them, I'm somebody super important. Oh, to for the sure. true crime up in fans world, you are somebody so important. But <laughs> right. what's always interesting is that you go outside that bubble and they'll be like, fuck, like, are you? fuck are you? Who is this yeah. guy? You know, and that's what you gotta remember. Like, oh, okay, well, I'm definitely nobody now. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the difference between fame and like fame. You know, when yeah. you're when you're in Hollywood, when you're A-list, for sure. And, and everybody knows Different who you level. are, it's just a whole other level. But but I will say, I I do believe the intensity is the same. Like yeah, the like people in this in, within space? this world, it's the same thing as being, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, fucking uh, Matthew McConaughey on the latest movie or whatever. For sure, those people get obsessed. And, oh yeah, and so the, and that's where I I, I I I asked if you're rich. I hope you are because I remember being in a in a phase where it's like <laughs> we're getting all of the downside. I'm not not rich. Of, <laughs> not rich. <laughs> when you get all of the downside of fame and mm-hmm. right. And, and you're not getting the upside yet. It's like, well, fuck this. <laughs> oh, yeah. There was a, definitely a point where I was like, we need to tilt these fucking scales here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, some yeah. zeros over before that I can deal with this yeah. shit. Yeah. But now I'm like, okay. That's good. I'm like, good. what's the next level? Like, yeah, honestly, I'm like, just like. And and, and it's it's open I'm sure fucking you can really. you yeah, know, it's possibilities. Like, it's like, there's no we've feeling. done so many things at Barstool. Yeah. We've been a techno EDM tour. We've done live shows. We've done... Audio, exactly. video, written, print. It's like, I don't know. You guys can do whatever. Your next thing exactly. is going to be a cartoon. Yeah. I don't know, fucking, it Ma- could be anything maybe, you yeah. want because exactly. you've proven that you can just do it. Yep. It's amazing, man. Come a long way from uh, from, from Portnoy posting your, your, your music video clips. I know. Right? Isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so you were you were in a band? I was in were, a band. What was the name we of the band? It's called Right Side of the Tree. Right Side of the Tree. And like we okay. made like hip-hop, pop. Party music, kind of really? like really. I remember like three hundred three, like that group, okay, like, okay. stuff okay. like that, kind of. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, like back when Barstool was mostly a blog. Yeah, like Dave posted a few of our our videos, and like I thought it was dope because we got way more views on it. Posting back then. it being like, like check he, this music out, or yeah, like he liked you, it, or like yeah, it was okay. like, yeah. I think the one that he posted, I tried to find it, but I think all that shit's gone. Yeah, we lost like everything pre. Yeah, but like he was like I guess, at the time, like <clears throat> like jamming out to it, and like yeah. And I mean, I didn't. Even, that's how I learned about Barcel was that. Do you know like what year this is? Roughly? It was like 2010, I think. Yeah, that's, so I started in 09, so that's like early days. Yeah, uh-huh. uh, that's funny, man. Mm-hmm. You guys were like geeking out when when you got posted to Barcel. Yeah, yeah, that's. I yep. mean, and so I've been following you guys since then. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was. Itch- I I didn't I didn't think you were a fan. Like I had no idea. I was just like. I knew I knew of Up and Vanished. We started talking, and I got the vibe that you like knew what Barstool was. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. fuck, for sure, shit, man. Well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you are the, like, poster child for that podcast story. The one where it's like, you know, it's, it, it, you're, it, you're almost corny. You're I, almost corny 100%. in the yeah. sense of, like, yeah. for the, the guy or girl out there who <laughs> hates their job and wants to just, like, oh, yeah. take the it's leap. corny as shit. You yeah. could be the next pain because, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, I'm not going to lie, it takes a shit ton of work, a lot of talent. A lot of luck, a lot of timing. Yep. But all yep. that comes together, you know, it can happen. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're not not rich. Live your dreams, people. Yeah. yeah. Man. So let's talk about this tattoo real quick. What are we gonna get? Uh, I actually don't know yet. I thought about getting like a pink smiley face. That okay. sounds re- absurd. A- any, and any, it is. Any, but uh, I don't give a fuck. Any thought behind it, or just like? I just thought it might look cool, mm-hmm. like to have like a color because I'm so fucking pale. I mean, you like, basically got a white canvas to work with. I do. So it's like, let's throw some color in there. Like, I'm just pale as shit. So, uh, honestly, I don't really know. Like, I kind of was like on a whim, like, oh, I'm gonna get like a VHS tape. Like, because, you know, that's how I started making little movies on cameras. I like, and, like that. I like so the vibe of that. There. Yeah. And this is like a and little tin- tinder foot on the uh, stamp. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I might regret these in like a year. But nah, those seem <laughs> those seem pretty pretty legit. I'm kind of just like whatever. Just, yeah. just do it. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. Uh, that mentality about life, man. It's, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and uh, last thing, I mean, do you ever feel like you'll transition out of true crime stuff? Because part definitely part of it thinks it's got to be a little bit morbid, you know? Absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like. Like I said, like I'm definitely not like that guy who's like foaming at the mouth, overly, yeah. overly obsessed about this. Right. Like you might think I would need to be to do this. Right. I geek out on telling this story. 
and like really making something that you're like, oh shit, that but you cliffhanger can, was amazing, right? Yeah, but you can do that with but any do sort that, of genre, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. So like storytelling at the core is like what I really am most passionate yeah. about. I and so I want to make do. movies. I want to do that. And do like, the op. Do and we got the some total stuff. Opposite, we got some bro. stuff in the pipeline. So you know, like we we've taken a lot of pitch meetings for different stuff, and yeah. like I know that it will eventually happen, and that my path to get there is what I'm doing right now. Right. This is how I'll make enough money to not give a fuck and be able to just go Doing take a risk and, yeah. and like not have to rely on anybody else. That's so clutch. And then meet the right people to help make it happen. I was, and I, that kind of dawned on me like a year or two ago. I was like, quit tripping. You gotta wait till that. This is yes. fine. Yes. I, I gotta see this through and then we'll do it. And, yeah. You know, the landscape changes, you meet new people. Yeah. The, the, I was reading a story about uh, the dude who created Squid Game on Netflix. I haven't seen it yet. Is it, it's awesome. Yeah, it looks he, crazy. He wrote yeah. it in 09. Did he really? And he got turned down for 10 years. That's classic and now, story. And now yeah. it's going to be the most streamed show on Netflix ever. That's and, insane. And maybe that's, you know, who knows? If, I don't know if he got denied for 10 years straight. Right. Maybe he got denied a couple times and then he put it on the shelf. But the market evolved and now people were ready for this wild, crazy yeah. murder show. And now they're maybe they're ready to listen to Korean shows with subtitles. And like yeah. all that shit happens and falls into place. So if you just keep like along the way. But yeah, I think if you could, if you did something like, your next shit should be like a love story where the cliffhanger is like, did he kiss her or not, man? Did yeah. he fall in love or not? Are they gonna like, make out next totally week? Soft. Yeah, because I, I, I just feel like you know what you do do is is got to be, it would weigh on me, man. Like I'm never, I would never go to a national park or or these fucking rural places where there's only like ten people in a town. It's like that's where you get disappeared. Yeah, I'm not doing any of it. It would weigh on me so much learning all about all these things. I'd be like. You need to do a, a whole series on fucking rainbows and butterflies. I think and one of the ways that we cope is like we just have a really dark sense of humor. Yeah, it's clutch and, and, too. And, you know, what I mean, it's just kind of like that's how we survive. Yeah, yeah. I think you people like right. us. It's like, yeah, man. Yeah, you know, I get it. You know, we can laugh at fucking <laughs> anything yep, at yep. inappropriate times. The more fucked up, the sometimes the funnier it is, uh, which is not always funny. I mean, I'm not gonna say what I'm thinking, but like, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> it's funny. I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people might not, but I, I got no, you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, man. So, you know, Up and Banished is the show. Uh, Tinderfoot is the network where Dead Wrong and, you know, a million other shows now it's for people to, to check out. Payne Lindsay on uh, on all social? Uh, yeah, it is. Payne Lindsay. Yep. So if you're new to it, I mean, I feel like silly even plugging it because I'm sure pretty much everyone's heard of Up and Banished. But if not, check out uh, three seasons. And the dude from season one's on trial right now? Uh, I mean... That's been pushed back so many, so many times. times. COVID and everything. So they're too, saying definitely. spring. Okay. But yeah, I mean, he's still awaiting trial. Right, yes. Right. You, and you think what, what what would be your guess predicted right now? What happens with that? Is that guy going away? Did he do it? Is he locked up? I honestly, I really don't know. Do so you I, think he did it? He did something. He's involved. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no way he's not involved. I think that he may be. Equally as equally as involved as somebody else, but he's right. definitely not innocent. He did something. Maybe did kill her. And will he go you know? down for something? I think so. Let's let's fucking hope he. Yeah. If he did do it, let's hope he does. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, uh, kudos to you for being a part of, of making that happen. So thanks, man. And thanks for taking the time to come on the show. I love it, dude. My pleasure, man. It's been great fun. story behind it, man. It's a great story. All right, the holiday season is approaching. All I want for Christmas this year. Is YouTube subscribers? We Please, got, we got to get to a hundred thousand. I want Please, that hundred thousand plaque. Uh, we've got a goal for uh, for all you out there, for everybody. At a hundred thousand subscribers, Polly Feidelberg will join us on the show. Maybe, well, if not, we'll probably have to trick her into it. But at a hundred k, you will get Polly content. So subscribe, click the bell uh, icon so you get notifications so that you're always watching. Leave a comment below. Talk about it. Post about it. Spread word. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. 100,000 subscribers on KFC Radio for Polly Feidelberg. Let's make it happen.